I'm Rick Garner, executive producer of Unexplained Cases. We're going to take a very interesting journey right now. I reached out to a variety of individuals from many different walks of life with really only two requirements for us having a conversation. One being that they have a belief in God, that they have a personal faith, and two, that they have some kind of an interest some skin in the game, if you will, with the paranormal. And with those two requirements, I spoke with quite a few individuals and asked them all the exact same questions so we can understand, can faith and the paranormal coexist? Let's find out. Unexplained Cases is supported by the American Paranormal Press. Carrie in Yon and Cullen Therapies. That there's a real trendy name called the paranormal. Bible and prayer, the Bible declares it's appointed once for man to die and then the judgment. Let me say that again. I don't want you to miss that when it comes to, well, I'm grieving. I love to communicate with my mom or my sister or my child or whoever. The Bible says it's appointed once to die and then the judgment. Boom. Luke 16. Thought about this this morning. The story of rich man and Lazarus. If you go back and you study that, you see the reality of hell, but you also see, let's see now, if there was a way to communicate with, and it was proper and biblical and right with those that are still there, and then then, I believe that would have been a great opportunity to introduce us to that, but it wasn't because it's not right. If your weakness is toward the demonic, or the paranormal, or you have an inappropriate obsession with it, run. Do not mess with it based on what God says in his word. You say, but no, no, there's no, there's no, but, 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 no. Run. Well, let's see, I went to Catholic school for a long time. I went, we used to go to confession and I would talk to the priest there. Um, the, the priest there actually told me several things that made me not believe um, in God. Um, and then later on, you know, he told me like the Bible was just a bunch of made up stories uh, and it wasn't factual. And this is coming from a priest, which really threw me. Um, so that made me not believe in anything until I actually started, um, paranormal investigating and looking into it. And, and, and it made me wonder because I'm like, where are these voices coming from? You know, who, what's making all this stuff happen around us that it's not supposed to be there. Um, and that got me curious and looking into religions and then, uh, through voices, um, the spirit box and other items that we've been using and equipment, you know, you get signals, you get signs, you know, on request and whether it's, you know, an actual spirit or a demon or even alien for that matter, we don't know, but it's a sign that there's something, there's definitely something after we pass on. Well, having been, having been dead and sent back by God himself, I always think back to that moment And then I had that salvation experience when I was about 12 because I had a lot of demonic attacks, uh, paranormal experiences growing up in my home. And this particular demon had followed me to the new home we moved to. And one day I was just laying in bed, just taking a nap, after I got home from school and I hadn't had a chance to close my eyes when my whole bed shook. 
the end of the bed shook like it was like somebody was actually putting weight on the end of the bed and shaking it and i said if if that is a presence shake that again and it shook again and i said this is a demon shake it again and it shook again and i prayed and i said in the name of jesus i pour the blood of christ the presence of the blood of christ upon you and command you to leave and then i said shake the bed again it never did it again and it left and from that moment on not only did i realize that jesus sent me back and that he's real but that the power of christ is real and there was like an awakening i can only describe it as a rebirth of the spirit of the soul it felt so much incredible joy i felt like i was filled with light and i always return to that even if i veered off course in my life i would return back to the light because I always recall how Jesus was there for me and the paranormal rescuing me from demonic attacks, and I, which I still on occasion experience. You know, as a child, uh, you know, I went through horrific things, as you know, but I always had like this um, blind faith in God, and uh, it was just automatic for me. Uh, my parents believed in God, but we never attended church as children. We were never baptized or anything like that. So, you know, didn't read the Bible, didn't know really anything about God, except for just having this faith, even though we were going through what we were going through. I knew that God was real. I knew that uh, he also helped us and had angels help us on, on many occasions throughout, um, you know, our living in that house. So it wasn't really until I want to say probably the late 90s, somewhere around 2000, that um, I had decided really to seek God and to make him first and to accept Christ. Uh, and then it probably wasn't until 2008, somewhere around there. Uh, that my wife and I got baptized together and everything changed after that. Although I say everything changed, it was still a process because, um, you know, it was the greatest uh, day and, and certainly I felt delivered from everything, you know, after that took place. But it was still a process. It was, uh, you know, one step forward and two steps backward because of the mindset. So when we're exposed to heavy doses of trauma on a regular basis it's very difficult to get out of that type of fear-based trauma-based way of thinking and living well i got saved when i was 17 and you know i've always struggled with acceptance and depression and when i got saved it felt like a huge weight was lifted off of me it felt like being in a room filled with smoke and then walking out into the fresh air. I mean, just just in the last couple of years, um, I've I've really leaned on my faith, mm. and I've learned more about how to use faith. Just in the last couple of years, than I have you know ever, I think. Um, because I've had to. So not really one experience. I think, you know, when my father died, um, I've had to, and maybe that was the reason that I'm leaning on my faith. Wow, I've never even talked about that mm. until right now. So, yeah. I mean, religion's always been part of my life since I was little. And I went to a Lutheran school, so faith has always been there. I've always gone to church and all the services. And I think when it really hit me was I was I was going through a really rough time, well, with the relationship that I had. And I was going to church a lot more. And I remember um, it was at the end of the service, and they were calling, you know, if you want to be saved. And, and everybody, you know, was walking up there. And I just had this, like, just sensation that I just wanted to go up there 
And I went up there and it was just a really good feeling. And I feel like at that point, um, I knew that I was like going in the right path. Yeah, I was uh, just actually a few months before I turned 20. And uh, I was definitely, I didn't know how to convince me that I was a sinner because uh, I was into a lot of things that were definitely bad for me. And uh, definitely not living a life that would have been pleasing to God. I was raised Roman Catholic and had even wandered away from uh, that faith by the time I was, uh, you know, 15, 16. I started, you know, drinking young, started drugging soon after. And, uh, you know, the rest of my life was a mess as well. Uh, and uh, for me, the uh, salvation experience was one where I actually felt I, I clean. I felt renewed. I felt uh, accepted for the first time uh, as, as I was. And, uh, yeah, it's been, you know, major part of my life ever since. I was raised going to church. Uh, my mom took me to church every Sunday as a kid. And then when I got older, I'd go here and there. I wouldn't go regularly. But I ended up going to, for high school, I went to a private Christian school. And uh, we had chapel services there. So we got a lot of the Bible uh, taught to us during that time in Bible class. And I think it was probably during that time that I really realized, I mean, I've, I'd always believed and, and known the Bible and such, but I think it was that time that I genuinely became saved. Uh, after that, I ended up working in a private school for some time. And uh, I've just always been very close uh, in my walk with God, of course, since that time. Uh, of course, you know, we all make mistakes here and there along the way. But, uh, you know, I've always felt that relationship strong enough to come back and repent and, you know, get back in his grace. And, uh, you know, I believe that whatever we do, of course, he's there with us. And, and on these investigations, when we go into a, a situation where it could be something more dark at play, uh, people ask, why aren't you afraid that you bring something back? Or aren't you afraid that something's going to happen to you? And that, of course, is is my answer, because if God's with you, you know, who can be against you? So it plays a huge role, of course, in everything that I do. My salvation experience, there, is, <laughs> there has been many. Um, f I've been fortunate enough to have had my life saved on more than one occasion by my guardian angel. Um, but I've been a very devout Catholic and had faith since I was a very young boy, my mother is Brazilian or my father and mother are both in heaven right now. May they rest in peace. But my mother was devout Catholic and a very spiritual woman from a village in the north of Bahia, Brazil called Cruz de Zalms, which means cross of souls. And there's no veil between the dead and the living there. So they pretty much grow up feeling that that's, um, that's commonplace. You know, they're not freaked out about it. But she, in, in addition to that, she still was a devout Catholic, and my father uh, was a very God-fearing man, Christian man, and they met after the war. But she had me, you know, it, it, as early as I was able to probably understand what she was saying to me as a young child, was all, always pounding uh, the religion into me, and also the spirituality. So um, my faith started at a very young age. My personal salvation experience is one that has been a lifelong journey. I guess I speak of salvation experiences as not a moment or a, an event that transpired like a baptism uh, but the journey that is life and the moments that include recommitting oneself to the life of following Christ and also being able to grow and mature in faith and spirituality, um, constantly challenging oneself, allowing oneself to be vulnerable, listen to other people's journeys, and 
not just take what was learned in Sunday school and church as a child and thinking that that is the salvation experience in a whole. Uh, my personal salvation experience really hasn't happened yet. Uh, it's something that's, that's an ongoing ordeal. When I was very young, um, my parents argued about the way I should be raised and what faith I should be raised in. So the compromise was to not raise me in either faith. And when I was about nine, they had told me that I have to do the research myself to learn about all the religions. And at that point, when I learn about all the religions, <clears throat> I'll be qualified to make a choice. Great. That's, you know, a great thing to put on a kid at nine years old. A nine-year-old kid that really doesn't know anything about anything is supposed to really research all the religions, and then of those that you read about, pick one that's going to, you know, work, work with you for the, rest, for the rest of your life. doesn't work. Um, what ended up happening is the more I read and the more I researched and the more I thought about it, um, the more common they were as opposed to as separate. Um, so there's, you know, I think there's something there. Uh, later, when I, when I got married, um, I became Catholic, uh, just if that's nothing else out of convenience, but for my salvation, it still hasn't happened yet. Um, sharing my personal salvation experience, um, so I grew up in a home that, um, I guess respected God and respected religion, um, but we didn't really go to church regularly. Um, I guess we were what was what some people call C and E Christians. So, um, so yeah, so I, you know, definitely grew up with like a fear of the Lord, but more from a, like an unhealthy place of fear, not so much a reverence or awe of God. Um, and as I kind of, you know, grew up, got older, um, you know, I, you know, hung out with people who weren't really following God, but I, there was always kind of that thing that would tug me back. And, um, by the time I got to college, um, uh, this was like the, like between like 2010, 2014, um, there were a lot of people in my family, older relatives who kind of all passed away one after the other. And, uh, two cousins who were fairly young, and just the whole answer of, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life and eternity really, you know, that weighed heavily on me. And so I really um, recommitted my life to Christ. Um, you know, I said the prayer when I was 12, um, but really just kind of understood what that meant um, and began to recommit my life to Christ during that period of just going to different uh, college ministry, and young adult ministry. I grew up very strict Catholic family, um, went to church every Sunday, whether I wanted to or not, the family made me go. Um, we had our own pew in the church that the entire family sat in. It was the fifth one back on the right hand side. <laughs> so, and I could probably, if I thought about it for a few minutes, be able to tell you the exact order that everybody sat in as well. Um, but it was very strict family. Um, I went to private Catholic school from kindergarten all the way through graduating high school. Um, yeah, I mean, we, uh, I lived with my grandparents for a little while um, when I went through my parents separating and divorcing. And um, one of the things that I did with grandma is we prayed the rosary every day. Every afternoon when I got home from school, we did a section of the rosary. So, I mean, faith has always been really deep in my upbringing and my thoughts and of how I do a lot of things now being a, you know, an adult, adult, or at least you can call it an adult, considering we still play with toys when we go check for ghosts. I've never told my testimony about this before. Okay, I grew up in a musically talented family that was gospel. Uh, I sang, my family sang, played guitar, all this stuff. We traveled all over the place. 
And I remember being a little girl, I would, I'd be one of those kids that was passed out in the pew sleeping and they were all jammed and playing music. So I grew up and I'm thankful for that. They taught me how to worship and have a relationship with Jesus and God, um, you know, that way. And, but towards the middle school years and things, my dad's job switched and, and, and stuff. And, um, we didn't go to church that much anymore and all that stuff, but I was grounded in it. I really was. And everybody has that backslide stage in life and you're, you know, adolescent, you don't know what you're doing. You're trying to figure yourself out all that stuff. But God always, uh, there was a place in my heart always for him. I've never questioned it. Um, I was raised with faith, not religion. Um, my parents were very supportive of anything and everything. They knew something weird was going on in here. Just weren't sure what but they supported it. Um, they never forced me to go to church, but we would have long conversations even when I was little about faith and the difference in faith and religion and God and, you know, these different things. So I was raised and never questioned it. I always knew he was there. Well, my interest in the paranormal started when I was about seven years old uh, at my grandparents' house. I was, my grandfather made up a story about a boy named Philip who would live in the closet. And it was basically, you be good or Philip's going to come out and get you. Well, over the years, little did he know there actually was a spirit residing in his home. And he, I don't think his name was Philip, but he adopted that name, Philip. And when I was seven years old, he started, I would start to hear whispers coming from the closet, from the basement, didn't matter where it was, but it would only happen when I was over at grandma and grandpa's house. And I would be, it would be, have to be quiet because I'd never hear the words. I would just hear him talking to me and I'd always say, what, what? And my cousin would be down there and we'd be playing pool or something. And he would say, you know, what are you talking about? I didn't say anything you know, like crazy lunatic little kid, you know? Um, and that's what started that. So, um, then fast forward a bunch of years and I started getting into, uh, researching the paranormal field in general. I would say afterwards, because right after I died and I came back, my house that we lived in, or well, even before I died, had some paranormal activity in it, but it ramped up after I died and came back because there were these dark entities that seemed to know something I didn't, that I was destined for something better, that God had great plans for me and they wanted to try and stop it. So they, I, they were terrorizing me. And they would do things like, I had a little tiny little stereo and the stereo would come on by itself and the dial would go up and down, up and down the full range of the dial and all the dials would spin on it by itself and I didn't plug it and I actually took it downstairs to the basement I uh, got all the tools the screwdrivers and got all the screws out of it and took it apart trying to figure out how could that possibly be while well, it was in front of me in front of my own eyes door slamming shadows actual shadow beings coming up from the floor coming out of the walls growling at me um, all sorts of harassment um, all sorts of horrible nightmares and I would pray and I would sometimes sing a hymn and that would dissipate those threats. My first experience was at age five, but I was four when we moved into that house. And uh, so, you know, as a five-year-old child, you know, no, no thoughts or interest in anything like that. And uh, so it just happened to me and happened to uh, my family members, especially my mother, who suffered more than any other person I've ever seen in my life. Um, and those sufferings came not only from the entities, which she was greatly affected by them, even physically assaulted. So was I. Um, but my father as well. And, and my dad was a good man who made some horrific choices. And um, he... Uh, it wasn't long after moving into the house that this uh, demonic influence began to manifest and, and really take hold. And, and he was the, the first target, I guess, because he was the head of the family, the strong one. They wanted to get rid of him. And so his character changed from a 
a good and decent, hardworking man, you know, to uh, a man that uh, in my, looking back on it now, my best uh, guesstimation on it would be that he was so greatly affected and this was a man's man, a man that was used to being in control of every situation, suddenly finding himself uh, in a situation that he couldn't control. And I think that really pushed him in a direction to escape reality through alcohol. Now, look, we are all free to make our choices. God gave us free will. But the devil can aid in a bed in that when we make the bad choice. And I think that's what happened. And his life and our life as well. Uh, went on this downward spiral, and he began to uh, physically abuse my mother on a regular basis between 1973 and 1975, and he left us, thank God, in 1975. I'm convinced he would have killed my mother had he stayed. And then uh, my mother came under regular uh, demonic attack after my dad left. Okay, my interest was way before... Uh... I've always, again, this is one thing people know about me. I've always loved horror movies. And when I was a kid, they had this show called Sightings. Mm. And they would have like, you know, UFO stuff, but also ghost stories were always my favorite. Even what Unsolved Mysteries, when they would have the ghost sections, it always just piqued my interest. So way before. I was raised... As a Christian, and as a Christian, you're you're taught to believe that um, believing in the paranormal or ghosts or anything that um, is, I guess, would be otherworldly uh, in in the terms of the paranormal is is not a good thing to think about, right? Or even accept. And as as you get older, um, I think you're at least with me, um, like I found like a personal relationship with you know, Jesus and, and being a Christian, having an interest in the paranormal and you know, growing up in the 80s, all the uh, horror movies and stuff that were around, you know, I think that it's always been there. Definitely in the last couple of years, it's gotten to be more where it's okay to... Um, to kind of wonder or even believe that that there is a paranormal thing going on around us. Um, it definitely came way before, because um, when I was younger, I had experiences in my childhood home that I couldn't explain. So definitely way before. I've always had an interest ever since I could remember, and actually after I got saved, it actually increased when I saw some of the things that I see in the scripture, because it's definitely, you know, uh, there and the, besides being alluded to there. So, uh, yeah, probably always. It was after. It was after and and before. Uh, you know, all along the way, my dad was always really interested in, in such things as like unsolved mysteries and a everything from aliens to cryptids and ghosts. And he was always watching those shows. So it always piqued my interest. And when I got old enough to drive, you know, we would always just drive around a place called the Brandywine Valley that was near my house up there in Delaware where I grew up. And something about these dark roads. I mean, it was just neat getting lost on these dark roads. And I learned, of course, through those travels that there were a lot of urban legends out there. And that, of course, piqued my curiosity. So it, more so the interest in the paranormal, it started as a fascination with just the unexplained, these spirits that may be out there. And as time went on and we started the organization and everything, uh, we started getting what we do now is primarily residential investigations. And I found out a lot of people might say it's crazy, but I found out I could combine the two, that it, it's almost like this was something that was meant to be, perhaps from God, that I didn't even know about because my interest in the paranormal got me going into these people's homes who are kind of on the fence Christian. They're struggling with something dark that's in their house, and I can actually offer them spiritual guidance and bring them back closer to God, and at the same time, find out what's going on in their house and help them to get rid of it. 
I was seeing spirit at a very young age, worked my first paranormal case. Uh, my sisters are eight years and 10 years older than me. They were renting a haunted home when they were in college. And I went to spend the night there. Parents had a date night, I guess. They stuck me with my sisters. And I came up close and personal with the spirit that was in their house. And from then, it was just, um, I felt even then that I was meant to be involved in the investigative aspect of the, the paranormal field and started, I guess, I was just a ghostbuster uh, at that time and um, juggled trying to be normal and keeping that from my friends, but on the side, you know, driving around on my Schwinn with my camera and my tape recorder and the little basket between the handlebars and going to, you know, remote deserted places and investigating and some people did know that I had that passion so if they had some issues with the paranormal they would reach out to me I would try to help I didn't have a clue what I was doing but I would try to help but it wasn't until my wife and I met uh, 18 years ago met fell in love got married uh, we knew we both had a passion for this I knew that she was very gifted and uh, we formed ghostbegone.biz, the ministry here in Las Vegas, started working cases. But it wasn't until after that that we ran into our first big, dark, um, demonic case. I thought if I could have an experience with the ghost or figure out what a ghost is, maybe it would come up with a clearer direction of what God is. If I could understand what ghosts are, if there is an afterlife, that really leads more up to a, a, a kind of dedication that they could possibly be a higher power or a God, or as we call it. You know, I, I think it probably was after. I don't remember having any experiences that were of paranormal or of just even a, a Holy Spirit nature until I was in college. I think they happened simultaneously, actually. That um, I'd always had a belief in, in the paranormal from you know early in life, and later in life I you know seen actual um, manifestations of it. But I think they're hand in hand. Uh, again, since I haven't been a salvation story, um, it's easier for me to believe in the paranormal at this point than salvation. Uh, maybe when my salvation comes, I'll be able to say something different. So I guess my interest was kind of before and after. Um, as I mentioned, I grew up in a household where um, kind of religion and just a world of angels and demons and there being like um, a supernatural presence was always discussed, um, but somewhat from more a, of a superstitious viewpoint for my mom. Um, she grew up very superstitious, like, I remember she would freak out if she saw hers, um, she was like, you can't wash clothes on Labor Day because you're washing someone's life away, you know, New Year's Day, a man has to walk through the door first, or you'll have bad luck, um, you have to have black eyed peas on New Year's Day, or you'll have bad luck, and, um, you know, she even said that, like, in our house, and just kind of around, like, she saw weird spirits or just kind of white ghost like ghostly um looking images um she told me that when her mother had passed away kind of i think it was the day before she had saw these two identical men dressed in white in the same elevator that her and her brother were in and she felt that they were angels there to kind of deliver a message to her mom that you know she wasn't going to make the surgery and pass away and she did pass away during the surgery um, so I feel like that, that sense of the paranormal have, has been with me for a very long time, just growing up with a very superstitious mom, someone who has like little figurines in the house, um, to protect her. Her car is like, you know, crosses and little angels, things like that. Um, and I've always kind of wondered about ghosts, um, you know, like more of an understanding of does ghosts exist and you know, being scared as a kid that there was ghost under my bed or, um, you know, there was, um, something in my closet, just kind of being afraid of the dark. Um, 
but um, as I, you know, became a Christian and definitely since I've uh, recommitted my life to Christ and just grown, I, I kind of see it for what it is, is, you know, there is this unseen world that, you know, there is this battle of good versus evil, angels versus demons that, you know, could exist right now, which is kind of creepy to say I'm in the basement. <laughs> um, but I do think that there is an element of truth in that. Um, not to the extent of what my mom believes. Like, you know, I don't believe in superstition. I mean, she had went to a psychic a few times and I don't believe in any of that. But I think that there are some answers to why there are just some things we cannot explain. Literally, my very first memories, I was waking up screaming because I was having dreams about what we know now as adults, as demons and angels. And let me explain this. I was describing what I was seeing in my nightmares. I was seeing these things taking me. I would wake up with scratches on me and I would see these big, beautiful, ethereal, otherworldly entities fighting these things. And it sometimes it didn't end well and sometimes it did and when i would wake up from these dreams these nightmares i would be screaming screaming it was awful my mother she didn't know what to do and when i and the reason i was screaming aside from the nightmares when i woke up there was i could see stuff in the room sometimes it was different colored orbs sometimes it was big huge black apparitions which looked like they had hoods on it wasn't a an anthropomorphic body. It looked like it had a hood or a robe. Um, it didn't really look like a monk either. Um, other times I could see actual faces of people, um, like these translucent looking people. And there were other times, and I believe that these are angels because I've seen them later in life. They, there were these entities, very tall, huge, and they were like this blue, silver, like the color of lightning. It looked just like lightning, but it radiated a more glistening effect. It was so bizarre. And it was different things every time. And she would have to take me in the living room and, you know, keep me calm. And I'd have to keep all the lights on until I would fall asleep in there. And I think I slept in her bed for a very long time. And I didn't know anything about religion. Um, you know, it wasn't until I, I got a little bit older, I had more and more experiences, petrifying experiences. I wrote about them and I'm talking just things I never wanna see on the ceiling, crawling in the room ever again in my life. It changed me. It shaped my entire existence and led me on this path, which I never thought would become what it is today. You know, it is enthralling. And it is beautiful and scintillating, but it's also extremely stressful and serious. It happened before, but it was amplified after. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'll tell you, the, the paranormal, the ghosts and the spirits and all that kind of stuff, and maybe possibly um, your relatives or something coming to visit you was before. Afterwards, I start understanding the spiritual warfare that goes on and the demonic and, and angels and all that stuff and how the battle is going. Let me tell you, if, if we, if God really wants to show us the spiritual realm, we can't comprehend it. And it would terrify us. I think I, I really do. People like to give us their opinion. You know, they all, everybody's got an opinion for sure. Um, but they'll come in and when I'm live on online or something, they'll come in and say, you're just talking to demons. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not saying you're wrong, but why are you so sure about it? You know, why, what makes you so confident that that's what's happening? And because I know there are people that say the, the, well, the Bible says this and this and this and this. And I'm like, okay, but we also have free will. And we have decisions to make even after we're done with this physical body. We still have decisions to make. So to say that they're nothing but demons and, and, and there is no grandma and grandpa and there's no dog brushing against you. Like I seriously have a hard time believing that. 
Yes, because when I was dead and I was out of my body, I was not a demon. I was human. <laughs> and, you know, I could have just been wandering around the hospital instead of going to the light that I have chose to. And I would be a, that in that case, I would be a ghost. So during the time I was a ghost, there may have been other people who could possibly see me that may have been very psychic sensitive. And they weren't seeing a they weren't seeing a demon. They were seeing me. And so the, my experience has been, even from my own death, I can tell you that not every being that you're seeing in spirit is a demon. We actually somebody who's passed. And they've simply, on their way up to the light, or um, perhaps they're holding themselves back because they feel unworthy of heaven and they need to resolve these issues before they can move on. And in fact, this is a belief in the Roman Catholic Church known as purgatory, where you're undergoing purification of your soul immediately after death. Even though you're forgiven and you're allowed into heaven, you still have some issues, some purification to go through before you get there. And we have a duty for these souls to pray for them and so they can enter into that peace without delay and enter heaven without delay. So when spirits come to me and they're not demonic and they're human, uh, most of the time, the vast majority of the time, these are people who have had issues with forgiveness. Either they're not forgiving themselves or they have a hard time forgiving somebody else for what has happened in their lives. And that could be, you know, a violent death. That could be where somebody else took somebody else's life. It could be my decision or my irresponsibility led to my death and it caused harm on my family because I brought this on myself while they're living with guilt, even after death. And they need to find a way to work through and release that guilt so they can move on successfully and join in heaven. And once they're in heaven, they're praying for us. And they're free to come back to visit us once they're there. Because God does not ever separate love, does not allow our loved ones to become separated from us. It's not like after you die, you go into a box somewhere in heaven and you don't come back and never hear from anybody again. It's not that way. You're still part of the body of Christ, whether you're in body or out of the body. And you can still work. As a member of the body of Christ, part of the body of Christ, whether you're in body or out of body. And that can mean being in heaven, praying and encouraging God to act in the lives of the living people, but also visiting living people and encouraging living people and helping living people, acting as guides or as intercessors to try to comfort and heal us and still work within those bonds of love within the body of Christ. Nobody really has the answer on this, but I'll give my best guess on it. I think that um, however God does it and why he does it, I do believe that God will allow our loved ones to kind of check in on us from time to time and maybe be around us. I don't know, pretend to know how that process works other than God must grant permission for this to happen. That's what I believe. I also believe that when that dimensional doorway opens, others can come in. And I mean, in the form of demons, that would be called a familiar spirit that could take uh, the uh, form and, and the uh, likeness and even the voice of the long lost loved one, or even an interaction that someone may have if they went ghost hunting and they went to some type of you know, haunted asylum or something like that. Uh, I've helped many people that have had those types of problems and picked up those types of attachments. So I will say that I absolutely 100% believe that God does allow our loved ones um, to be around us at times. And whether that is we catch a glimpse of them or have a feeling or even you know, hear them or have a vivid dream about them. Um, I feel that some form of contact uh, on the back end of that, no doubt, uh, the devil 
we'll have these demons in place and ready when that dimensional doorway opens to sort of try and sneak in. And they are familiar spirits impersonators because the devil is the uh, original liar and con man and salesman and uh, mimic. So he, uh, he tries to mimic everything that God does and he puts his vulgar twist on it. So we have to be very, very careful. And that's where the scripture comes in talking about test the spirits. And so we have to be ready to test those spirits um, if, in fact, we are having such an experience. So if a spirit suddenly uh, appeared to me or manifested, A, and I'll say this, uh, the closer connection that we have to God, the more holy discernment he will give to us. So if such a spirit were to manifest and say that it was a spirit of one of my dearly departed loved ones, I would know the difference. And I'll tell you why. Uh, you can feel, and this is from God giving us discernment. You can feel if that spirit is good. You can feel the love. You can feel the frequency and vibration. Um, this all ties in. But if you get the opposite and, you know, you have that, ugh, you know, terrible negative feeling, well, then, you know, that's not of God. And furthermore, even if it was, uh, you know, the great feeling and the, the wonderful manifestation, I would still test the spirit by binding and rebuking and commanding it to depart. And if it didn't depart, well, then I know right then and there, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that it is, in fact, the spirit of a departed dearly departed loved one and that God is allowing us. So it's all about testing the spirit. I've had UFO experiences like that, Rick, to where, uh, and this was, I believe last year, um, these two UFOs appeared in the sky across. I, I live on the, uh, one of the higher up floors and I looking out my window and I see these two objects. So, I'm watching, and this was like 5 a.m. in the morning. It lasted from 5 a.m. to 5.12. And uh, I'm looking out the window, and I started uh, binding and rebuking and casting out. They did not leave. I started praising God. Was, Thank you, Father. Praise you, Father. Glory you, Father, forevermore in Jesus' name. And they responded. As I was saying that, the objects grew. The, the brightness it was literally bursting white. And they grew, you know, it was like the lights grew bigger in size as I was thanking God and praising God. So I would absolutely 100% say that it was a divine encounter and I praise God for it. Well, as a non-Christian, I was taught that, yes, you could interact with, you know, human spirits. But when I became a Christian, I was, you know, taught by my first church that, no, that's not impossible and that. It is, you know, demonic influences masquerading as the ghost of our loved ones. I, I think when you grow up as a Christian, especially for me, it was, you know, it was wrong and looked at as they are demonic because why would, why would a person who who is uh, a Christian or a believer in Jesus Christ be left here. Um, so there would not, so there would be no reason they would, you know, go to heaven. And the only thing that would be left here essentially would be the, the demonic presence of a person. Honestly, growing up, I never heard anything about, about that, like even going to church or anything um, that I could remember that spirits or things like that ever came about. It wasn't until my adult life where I was in this um, woman's Bible study and we were all sitting around and I just, I think I made a comment about like a TV show or something that I watched and the um, the lady who was the the girl that put the whole thing on, she just totally was like looking at me like, that's not good. That's not you, that's evil that's this and that and I was like really like I was really surprised and um I think ever since then I've always been kind of wondering um 
you know, like both sides, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, it wasn't until my adult life where I um, would hear more that it was bad and things like that. Because I never thought it was. When I was growing up, uh, I mean, I, you know, heard and believed that you could, you know, interact with, uh, you know, with the spirits of, uh, of people who had died. Uh, and uh, later as a Christian, you know, I heard that you shouldn't. Uh, but in my ministry, I've dealt with, uh, you know, I've, I've dealt with deliverance ministries where I've actually uh, spoken with demons. I think there's this sermon as well because there are masquerading spirits as well. And uh, in the Bible, it talks about in several places, it talks about spirits or ghosts in that uh, way. Even when Jesus walked on the water, they thought it was uh, a ghost. So even in, you know, in biblical times, there were uh, ghosts or spirits of, uh, of humans on the earth. Of course, in this field, I'm open to many possibilities, you know. So as far as whether, if I were to firmly say this can't happen or this doesn't exist, it would have to paint it black and white in the Bible for me and say, this is all spirits or the devil. But I don't believe it does that. I believe there's many places where the scriptures actually account for human spirits. Uh, so I, I'm open to the possibility, and I believe the possibility, that many spirits people encounter could be people who walk the face of the earth in human form at one time or another, whether a relative, somebody that's attached to the land or lived in the house. A at the same time, I believe that demons are very deceitful. The devil's very deceitful. So a lot of times something that's a lot darker can also use this mask as a way to get into somebody's home. It can appear as their deceased relative and they can welcome this spirit in. And it's really something more than a human spirit. So yeah, I do believe of course in the possibility of human spirits. Uh, and I, I also believe that sometimes not everything is quite as it seems. Ghosts on every single device, like every device that I've used, they say they're being chased by demons. Every time they say that the demons reside here on earth and that if they don't go into the light, which they said they have the choice and they have, they're given a certain amount of time, just hundreds. I have so many of times where they've said this, literally their own voices recorded. Um, it's not just like some PSB seven or other little device. It's legit. I specialize in recording these entities voices while they're talking and I pick up on so many things. It's, it's just, it would blow your mind. It's, it's difficult to fathom, but they, um, they talked about if they don't go into the light within a certain amount of time that it goes away and they have to find a person who has it. My approach is much different than what a priest may be. And I think what has turned out for me, having so many years as a ghostbuster on my belt, I kind of take a when in Rome approach to it. I've seen a lot of things, done a lot of things, heard a lot of things that a lot of people in my field probably haven't. So if I was a priest in a church, I probably would have already been excommunicated by now because I do a lot of thinking out of the box and Johnny on the spot decisions and, and, uh, and uh, moves went out in the field. Um, which a lot of other um, people in my field may not agree with all the time, and they don't, and I hear from them all the time, especially the ghost thing. I'm probably one of the few. Bill, I've talked to Bill many times. I know he believes in ghosts, but there's not a whole lot of us that do believe in ghosts. It's either demons or angels or angelic beings of some sort, but there's no ghosts. And I'm I'm a big believer in ghosts. I tell people all the time, I don't shy away from it. I do believe in ghosts. Do I believe I've been deceived? Oh, absolutely. I'm only human. I'm sure in my travels, demons more than once have presented themselves to me as light beings or human spirits. And uh, that's not what they really were. Mm. So I have to drop into a lot of deep prayer all the time. Try to keep, uh, st when I'm working a demonic case, I try to stay as much in a state of grace as possible. A lot of prayer, hope my discernment and my spidey senses, you know, 
kick in when I'm around a legitimate uh, dark malevolent entity and I can kind of make uh, make that um, judgment call when I'm there, you know, handling the case. Well, that's, see, that's a misconception. There are many uh, scriptural, script, scriptural, oh my God, biblical passages, I'll just use the word biblical, biblical passages that um, have ability of spirit being there. You know, I know God was the son of God and technically God, but uh, he, he came back, he arose, right? So that shows a, a ability of spirit right there. Samuel, I believe as well. And of course, um, if I remember right, Solomon, um, even though they were quoted all to be demons, he called upon spirits to help build, you know. So um, he used the ring that St. Michael gave him, right? So, so you look at all these things, it, it, they're presented, but people want to jump to where, like it says, beware false prophets, uh, beware you speaking to the dead, but it says beware speaking to the dead, right? So um, these things are presented, but people want to jump that all spirits are demons. And I think it's not a bi bad mindset to have, because if you think about it, right? And the one thing I try, even though I dabble in it, I investigate and I do some sort of communication. Sometimes it's more statements and uh, religious provocation uh, in the cases that I do more than kind of asking why you're here and stuff like that. Because I don't want to invite, I don't want invocation. I don't want to think that I'm trying to be buddy buddy with it where it tries to intercept into my life. But I think in that same format, I think spirits do exist or ghosts or some ideologies of it. I do believe intelligent and residuals uh, hauntings do occur. And, but the thing is, is people always ask me, well, then what is a ghost? And I don't like to use people's names as advantage, but you know, I want to respect the man that I heard it from first is, and I respect this. And even though it's the simplest answer, Brian Cannell once said is I don't know. And for somebody that you would find respectful and that's been on all these shows, you'd think that you'd come up with some bullshit response of what a ghost is. But his answer was, I don't know. And it is clearly that of a defined answer that is, I don't know what a spirit is. But I do believe that there are different characteristics to these things, characteristics to demons, characteristics to unclean spirits or negative malevolent spirits. And there's differences in characteristics to poltergeist, which is... PK activity, people tend to use the, the root word of poltergeist as noisy spirit, but poltergeist is usually because of an adolescent female or male, and it is their emotions playing, key and creating. But there's these characteristics, like people don't know, what, there's poltergeist levels, like there's level one through five in pol like poltergeist cases. People don't know these things, so these misconceptions are there. So when you don't adequately research these things, of course you're gonna think, Okay, everything is a demon, but like I said, it's not a bad mindset to have because you're dealing with unknown. You're dealing with I don't knows, and when you're communicating with these things, the best case idea to have is be cautious. Um, as far as human spirits go, I don't know. Um, I've never had a personal experience with regards to what could be considered a previous soul or spirit of a of a person who lived on the earth having encountered anything with that i've had a ton of people very close to me whom i trust who've had a number of encounters people in my own family hearing conversations like a couple in bed at night reviewing the day uh, just kind of talking as a husband and wife would um, that you could hear through the other, the wall of another room. Um, I've had my father and my niece who both experienced the same thing in the same room of our family farm. I've had friends who encountered apparitions. Um, I've heard stories of children who saw what they may have thought were angels, but found out later that those um, beings that they thought perhaps were angels were also found in a space right where people had been buried. Um, so, and then I was part of 
the unexplained ghost hunting experience in its earliest days where we were surrounded by Civil War um, battlefields and where we experienced, uh, members of that team experienced what looked like humanoid forms of apparitions in their um, gathering of technical video and audio, audio recordings. Um, I have never had an encounter with what I think was a human before. My personal experiences with the spiritual realm have all been what I felt were the Holy Spirit. However, I don't discount that we know there is another era and there is another place. And so who's to say until we're there that that is not real and not here with us in another plane or another dimension that we can't see and hear all the time. Just as there are um, good and bad humans on the physical plane, uh, I, I think there's both um, polite and evil spirits um, on the paranormal plane. And I think they are among us. And I think that the only reason that we don't see them or are aware of them, we probably see them all the time. But for so long, you've been taught that you can't see them, you shouldn't see them, they don't exist. And so at some point, even if you saw them as a child, as many people have um, when they were younger, they quit seeing them after being you know, told repeatedly, you don't see these. So I, I think they still exist. Um, I'm not, I don't really know completely if they're good or evil. Um, maybe it depends what they were in their previous life. You know, I was taught that things like the Ouija board, stuff like that was wrong because you're going to invoke, you know, bad spirits that you don't want. Um, but I, I think that growing up i believe that there was some kind of interaction you could have between human spirits and like angels or ghosts um or demons um i mean i definitely believe in angels it says so in the bible and i definitely believe in demons um again i do think that there's this world around us that you know we're protected from like there's a veil that we cannot see and it would probably freak us out you know if we literally saw like an army of angels surrounding us or you know, if we saw demons that were whispering in our ear or attacking us, it would freak us out. And I do think that that does exist on some level. Dark, heavy feelings in a house, growls, um, scratches, uh, objects being tossed or thrown. All of those are associated with demons. Um, that's the first thing people think of. You go into a house and, you know, you see this thing come flying at you. They're like, oh, there's demons in the house. We Let's go call a priest or call somebody to fix us. That's not the case. 90% of what you deal with that is dark and horrible and just you get in there and you just you feel it where it's just heavy on you and you just – it's just awful. I mean, I've had cases where you walk into a place and it's so heavy on you, you can't breathe. Um, one of the places I invent, or I did a blessing on, as I was doing the blessing, it felt like something was grabbing at my throat. And it got to a point where I was having problems talking and almost had to stop. Um, not demons. Um, people need to understand that Yes, demons exist. Yes, they're out there. Um, but that's not going to be what you normally encounter. It's going to be the old man that lived in the house for 30-some years, hated kids, and a family moves in with three little ones that are running around screaming, throwing stuff all over the house. He doesn't like that. The way you were, were living, we're pretty sure, and I'm not ever going to say is because... We don't know, obviously, that if we knew, we wouldn't be investigating. 
but um, we're pretty sure that the way you were in life is the way you're going to be in death. So, I mean, I'll be a smart ass person that yells at people to get off the grass when I, after I die, but um, you know, I'll probably look forward to haunting a lot of people just because I'm going to laugh at it. I believe that in 100%. Uh, there's oftentimes where I think we're actually in hell now. Um, this, you know, if you think of all the, the, the trials and tribulations that we go through on a daily basis in a human society, this world is horrible. You know, it, there's horrible things that happen. This very well could be uh, one version of hell. You know, we don't know. But as far as free will goes, um, I definitely believe that free will comes into play once you pass on. You Once we leave these meat sacks behind, um, you know, that's where I believe the, the reincarnation may come in or whether you decide to cross over or not and go to where your believable heaven would be. Um, or if you get judged, you know, then you either go one way or the other. You know, this is where free will comes in and helps, you know, you choose. You have some choice in the matter as far as what happens and what you do. Yes, it could be because if somebody is holding on to a lot of hate, um, let's say a person has gone through a bitter divorce and it was traumatizing and they died in poverty and say, well, they're hanging on to their hate. All they have is hate. And it doesn't let them uh, move on. It doesn't let them release all that anger, all that rage. They still have to forgive. And because they're hanging on to that hate, that hate is keeping them separated from us and from God. But if we become aware of that person, of that soul, um, perhaps from a paranormal sense, perhaps somebody like me that's sensitive enough to pick them up and can actually see them and interact with them, then I can offer them counsel and say, please understand that you need to forgive. When you forgive and you see heaven and you cross over there, all of this goes away and you are complete and whole again and you're made a whole person. And that person can is then, if they forgive, they're free to go. On the opposite end, I do know that there is actually hell and I was actually shown hell. And I was actually guided through it. And hell is a world, I wouldn't say that's not beneath us, but behind, sort of behind our, re our reality. And it's a fallen world and it's rebellious. It's, it's like a nation, but it has suffering and pain as its currency. If you want to put it that way, currency or its power, it controls money to a great extent. There's corporations, there's banks, there's militaries, there's governments that have actual written contracts with them, with hell. And hell likes to stab at heaven. So there are buildings in there that's, that look like jarred, broken glass because they want to stab at heaven. And these entities um, that are there, they're always at war with us and they're at war with God. And they like to target in their earth types of entities that, speci that specialize in certain types tax or specialize in certain types of sins anything is possible and you know i've really had some thoughts on that as to why um if in fact something like that is real and why uh you know would god allow that to happen because you know it can be um very black and white in the sense that you know when we depart the earth we certainly all I think most would hope that, uh, you know, we're going into God's heavenly kingdom. Um, why? And again, what is this? Why is this? Uh, is it the fact that um, it's a familiar spirit impersonating that individual saying they're stuck trying to lure in somebody and then gaining a foothold in their life? You know, is it that? Um, if not, then I would, if I could ever ask God a question, that would certainly be one of them as to, you know, why, how is that possible? 
it, it's not like you know if the 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 spirit is quote unquote stuck i don't understand uh, what that process would be why you know is it perhaps you know what can the there's no more body there's no more physical body to be able to um you know do anything other than perhaps just stay in this centralized location and again whatever that entails whatever type of building or structure that is um is it an entity that is stuck or is it part of a life essence um that we may have as well that so when we expire on this earth our soul departs the body but is there something else is there a life essence that remains from each and every individual um that turns into some type of uh loop or time stamp or something that uh you know from the energy of each and every individual that you know has a soul in a human body uh is there a life essence that remains and if that is so then the question after that would be well how come you know only a certain few seem to leave these time stamps and and those i don't have answers for that so um again is it possible for these quote unquote stuck um, i would say yes but at the same time i would say it could be a, a devil in disguise and i've had so many cases like that rick to where people came to me and they were just their lives were shambles because they said oh you know i went and did this ghost hunt and this spirit you know spoke and said it was stuck and all this and i had to help it to cross over meanwhile the person now has opened themselves up and through legal right through knowingly unknowingly invitation and invocation now the devil can legally have a presence in that person's life and create all kinds of havoc and God will allow it because of our free will. That's a tough one because you got to think again, God could do anything he wants. So could he allow that to happen? Perhaps, yeah. But when I heard this, I immediately thought of the story of King Saul in First Samuel chapter 28, when he went to the witch of Endor and told her to, you know, summon Saul. Mm -hmm. And the yes, serious I mean. part was she did. Mm -hmm. So I think perhaps it could be free will. Or again, with this, you know, it was God allowed it because Sam, King Saul needed to hear it. I think that when when we die i i do think that when we go to the light and it is our time that you know we we end up in heaven but i do think that there are some people and some 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 spirits that are left here on earth for whatever reason to find you know again with with the people we've had on it's it's amazing some of the the stories that that you hear about being being left here on earth to try to figure out where they're supposed to be well i do believe that there's earthbound spirits definitely and i think i also do believe that um there's spirits that are probably aren't ready to go into the light but not necessarily for them to have an unfinished business, but I feel like maybe to help whom they're trying to help to to okay. help with their unfinished business. Yeah, Paul talks of being uh, for the Christian, you know, being absent from the body, present with the Lord. So I think that's probably uh, less likely in a believer. But I do believe that in uh, unbelievers, mm -hmm. uh, that they, you know some of them might be stuck. That there's things that they haven't uh, dealt with or finished yet. 
uh, unresolved issues, uh, if you will. Uh, and uh, I know we had a, uh, the house that we moved into when I was in high school, uh, we had experiences with uh, a ghost, a spirit of a woman in the house. So, uh, you know, and I don't, I didn't feel it was demonic. So, uh, no, I do think that that's, yeah, it's possible. I'm on board with all of that. Like I said, I think there's so many, there's far more questions, I believe, than there are answers. And I do believe there's just, it's overwhelming how much we don't know. And it always, you know, I try not to let too much get to me and upset me here. When I run into people that seem to know it all, um, that's a little disturbing. They're, they're limiting themselves greatly, especially if they're in this field. All I can do is testify to you a couple of situations that have always, that I, that's never left me. And it was that one girl. I was sleeping on a sleeping bag on the floor of my sister's house, and they were hardcore flower children. They were uh, hardcore hippies, but they all, my father had money, so they always had some money, and they made sure they went to school, but they were like that, you know, and then they hung around with a lot of hippies, and the home that they were in was in a relatively new neighborhood in Reseda, but it was this one house that looked like it should have been torn down, but they didn't tear it down, and it reminds me of that movie, The Burbs. And this one house they were renting and one of their friends comes down the stairway in the middle of the night and she's dancing across the floor. We distinctively got eye to eye contact and then she danced right into the fireplace and disappeared, which blew my mind, jumped out of my sleeping bag, ran upstairs, jumped into bed with my sister. And that's when they, they hadn't told me that the house was haunted prior to that because they knew I would have probably have come over to the house and slept. But the following day, before they took me home, they were doing their thing, whether it was maybe laundry or cooking or out in the yard doing yard work. I came face to face with this girl, clearly, without her even moving her lips, clearly, as if she was actually talking in my ear, I could hear her tell me her story, which was that she had died of an overdose in that home before my sisters had moved in. And it just was so natural for me to tell her, well, where are your guardian angels? And uh, she said that she knew of them and knew that they were around, but she wasn't ready to leave yet because she's a young girl. She still had family here, friends here. She was unsure if there was going to be judgment, you know, where wherever she needed to go. And I'm probably stealing lines from everything that my sisters and mother used to tell me. But I just told her there is no judgment and you need to go there now. And she left. And my sister said they never saw her there in that home since that time. Now, my a good friend of mine who was actually, oh, my God, I can't think of anybody that I knew longer who was more of a childhood friend than this guy. And he moved to the West, East Coast. Hadn't heard from him in many years. And then I heard from his sister that he was dying of advanced colon cancer and was in the hospital. Somehow she got my number to him. We spoke a couple of times, but the night that he died, he called me up. Now, my wife is laying in bed. She had a feeding tube in for over a year, couldn't speak for months, couldn't even swallow water for months. She had a Tongue cancer, throat cancer, medullary thyroid cancer. It metastasized to a bunch of lymph nodes in her neck. <clears throat> she was uh, basically, I'm watching my wife die in bed one night. And I had went to this all night chapel around the corner. And I crawled on my hands and knees from the front door all the way to the altar, threw myself on the mercy of the altar and begged for God to spare her life. I come home, my phone is ringing. It's my friend. And he calls me just to tell me, and now this guy's an atheist. He calls me to tell me that I just saw God and I wanted you to know that he told me to tell you that you need to continue to fight those responsible for Sharon. And at that time, like I said, I was, I took time off. I hadn't really left the field. I was considering it. But I didn't really leave the field till I went had an attack. But at that time, I was thinking about walking away because I didn't really know what I was going to do had my wife 
passed away that night. We went through some dark nights. In my opinion, that kind of depends on what your belief is. But I definitely think, um, you know, crossing over is what you, what everybody refers to as what happens when you leave your body and you decide to go. Uh, everybody says that if you don't cross over, you're stuck on Earth, which very well could be, um, which is what everybody thinks that ghosts are is the spirits that decided i don't want to cross over i'm going to stay on earth and finish my unfinished business take care of my family whether it be that or figure out who killed me you know something like that um th that's where that free will comes in again that we were just talking about you know if you chose to be here then yeah maybe that's what's happening um but i tend to believe that even if you do cross over or if you go into the light which is a whole nother thing i can get into in a minute <sighs> yeah then you can still come back you know you, if you decide that that's what you do and you don't get sent downstairs then you can come back um some people say that they've come back from hell it's kind of a big pill to swallow but it's possible you know um, as far as people saying go to the light, I don't know if you want me to go into that. I know you already know how I feel about that. But uh, <laughs> when you're a paranormal investigator, if you're a ghost hunter, whatever you want to call yourself, you don't need them need to tell them to go to the light. I hear it all the time. People say, go to the light, go to the light. And they think they're helping them and which is all fine and good. But what people don't realize is the light isn't there. If they're lost, then they're, they don't see a light. They are lost. If there was a bright light there, sitting there, blaring them in the face, they would notice it and they would check it out. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing when you do a crossover, say you do a crossover prayer, which is what I do. Um, it's basically asking a higher power to create a light, a staircase, a bridge something to help them transition from one stage to the next where they need to go. Right. And I've been allowed to visit because it's because you don't have to be dead to go there. You can be taken out of your body and taken there. And if you remember Paul, um, he had a vision and he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, but it was caught up to the third heaven. Very similar to me where, you know, I'm, be in the dream state and I'll be taken up there and uh, we've shown so much of heaven and there's so much beauty all around it. There are people that actually have farmland and they work. There's a place for adults who have been abused as children where they can live as kids again and they essentially have their own little village. I mean, there's a lot of animals there. And I remember in particular a great city and I was taken to the city and people were throwing a parade for me. And I was being uh, car or carried in a car through the city. And it was, there was like a ticker tape parade for me. There was bands playing, marching, and everybody cheering me going through the city. And they're telling me, all these people were telling me, you made it. You made it this far. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. Look how far you've come. And we're celebrating it. And, you know, if everybody gets a parade in heaven, well, that's a lot. To, that's really good to look forward to. Because um, I had my own parade in heaven, and I wasn't thinking of myself as anybody particularly special. But, you know, they, people in heaven were throwing a parade for me. How can I say this? I love all people, and I have nothing against anybody. However, I have strong beliefs, and I live by them. And there's not a man on this earth that can lead me anywhere. Only God can. Uh, so when you hear terms like that, you know, crossing over into the light, I, it strikes me as kind of new age type of jargon. Um, I hope that when my time comes to leave this earth, I am being taken uh, by God, Yahweh's angels, 
into his heavenly kingdom. And whether that is ascending into his kingdom, whatever it is, that's where I want to be going. Um, uh, crossing over uh, into the light. I mean, perhaps, I mean, if the intent, if the intent on the person that says it, if their reference is to heaven, okay. Uh, but anything other than that, I certainly wouldn't be interested and it wouldn't grab me for a second. So again, uh, when my time comes, I certainly, uh, my only hope and focus is to be in, in Yahweh's heavenly kingdom. The crossing over, I do believe that could reference heaven, yes. Or if you live, you know, a life not worthy of heaven, it could mean hell. I think normally people do think um, as as when you go to the light or cross on over that you do go to heaven. You know, we do a podcast and we've had a lot of people um, come on and talk about that that obviously heaven is a real thing but that hell is even more real and so i think those terms although they they could be interchangeable i think it it does mean you could actually cross over into hell depending on how you live your life i feel like with the term look into the light or, or see the light and things like that. I always hear those in movies, okay. you know, look into the light. So for me, I feel like just hearing that phrase, that would mean heaven. But I guess kind of what Larry said um, with the crossing over, I guess crossing over could just mean either or, you know, where are you crossing over to? Is it heaven? Is it hell? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess we don't know, but I feel like looking into the light is more of heaven and you see the angels and you see this bright, beautiful light. And yeah, I mean, I uh, actually, I I worked with a guy. I met with a guy, one of my uh, patients uh, when I was working as a drug and alcohol counselor who actually had a near-death experience and talked about his experience with going towards the light. So I think that, yeah, Larry's right. I think it could be, uh, you know, uh, heaven. It could be maybe uh, someplace before you go to uh, to hell. I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, we usually associate light with, uh, with heaven and darkness with hell. So I think that's, we usually think of heaven when we hear that phrase or those phrases. I, I gotta say, I really don't know. I, I've heard a lot of psychics talk about crossing people over to the light and uh, they seem to think it's a good thing. I've questioned it. I've wondered if crossing over the light does mean you're going to face judgment. And that's why some people stick around because they're afraid of what's going to happen. They're reflecting on their life and they're thinking, what if I cross into that light and it's, it's not a good light, you know, I'm, I'm going somewhere else. Um, there's a lot of things I've, you know, read and about the uh, judgment and such. And they talk about the dead rising. You know, uh, those that are in, in the dead will be brought up. And that kind of made me wonder that if they're going to be brought up at that judgment time, is that talking about all the dead or all the people who died not in heaven yet? Are they going to be called up to judgment and then put into heaven when Christ comes back? I really don't know. I mean, there's so many ways to interpret it. But, of course, that's one theory, you know, and if if they're not in heaven where are they are they wandering around or some in a you know this time not pass for them does it seem like they just close their eyes and they wake up and it's several years later and i, I guess the best example with this is people say well you you know you're going to a place where there's a revolutionary war a spirit from the revolutionary war and, and you're talking about technology some will say well he should understand it because he's been here for 200 and some years but on the other hand what if he's only stepped through the veil for a matter of moments each time. So he's only spent the total of like an hour on this side of the veil, you know, even though he's been dead for 200 some years. It's just, it's just so weird to think about how that happens. Are they still here? Um, I would tend to think that that light, if there's a spirit that's on earth and they have the option of heading towards the light, I would think that would, be, that would probably be judgment in my opinion. First coming out and I was showing people how to cross over spirits, what a lot of psychics do, what a lot of even paranormal investigators do. If it's done 
in the way that we know, which is always to do with prayer. It's a beautiful thing. Oh my gosh. I mean, the messages, the names, the memories that we get and the things that they say on the recorders, you know, it's undeniable. It's beautiful. And it doesn't feel bad, you know, and then everything's gone. They cross over. Like they say they're crossing over that they can see the angels. We see the angels. We saw the angels. Like they say that. I had some church friends a few years ago that um, the, the husband was getting close to death. He was in failing health, had been hospitalized a number of times. And this was probably the last time he was actually in the hospital. Um, and his wife was in the room with him and he started hearing these, this music. And he said, where's that music coming from? He thought something playing down the hall. And she didn't hear anything, but he was so emphatic about the music that she stuck her head outside, walked down the hall, talked to a nurse. Is there some music playing somewhere? There was not. She came back, she goes, there's no music. He goes, you can't hear that? It's like clear as day. He said, and it's beautiful. But he's like, I just can't figure out where it's coming from. And she never could hear what he was talking about. Well, later on, he was discharged from the hospital and he went home. And he heard the music again. This time it was clearer. Not so far away. It was absolutely gorgeous music and she still couldn't hear it of course and then one day he looked out in the backyard and saw two people out there and he panicked because like what are two people doing in our backyard he says go lock the door real quickly don't you know there's two people out there and she looked, she locked the door, but she looked and she didn't see anyone outside. And he says, they're right there. He could see them. And he was just emphatic that there were two people in the backyard. And it unnerved him. It didn't bring him peace. But shortly after he passed and his wife is just convinced that he was hearing the angels singing, calling him home. And that those two people were angels there to usher him away from his earthly life. And um, I kind of believe it too. He was, he just believed it so wholeheartedly that it was right there in front of him. I think that the spiritual realm side of it is that they're always accessible but the human side of it, there's a lot of people that shut that off and are closed minded and they never open it. I think that we have more power on, on the human side than the spiritual side to be able to open up our minds to those things and to register. I think everybody could have one, one of those. I don't, I don't like calling it psychic. I, I like calling it discernment. So um, I think that it just depends on that individual that's, actually flesh living to be able to tap into those things. I think that the spiritual realm can always be there, but you have to have that discernment too. What are you speaking to? We're all born mediums. We're all born that way. We're all born with abilities like that and it's trained out of us. There's no such thing as ghosts. Oh, okay. I guess we're then. I'm if something happens, I'm going to get scared now. I've never taught my kids that there's no such thing as ghosts. But anyways, mediums. They're until you actually come across a very real medium that will prove it to you, you're going to be a skeptic. That's just the way it is. You know, unless you uh, experience a very paranormal or ghostly experience, you're going to be a skeptic. That's just human nature um if you haven't that's what i say skeptics are are just people that haven't experienced it yet um but mediums yes mediums are very real very very real um i i've worked with probably i don't know 40 throughout my life and 
I would say four of them actually made me believe them. So a lot of people claim to be things to be cool. But if you are claiming something like that, please back it up. Because there was a, a common practice of the time, and it's still a practice today for some people, to use the dead to tell the future, um, to imprison these souls. Um, but that is referring to people that they're that are either in purgatory or in hell that they're communicating with, where I'm communicating with people that are already in the body of Christ. They died forgiven. They're destined for heaven. And they're still my brother and sister in Christ, and I'm still helping them. And whether you're in the body or out of the body, I'm there to help make that connection and help that person move on. We are commanded as part of the body of Christ to help our brothers and sisters in Christ. So whether you're in the body or out of the body, as far as I'm concerned, you're still part of the body of Christ. You know, I'm communicating with angels. And if there's something that's negative or demonic there, I can let you know. I can warn you and let you know you need to pray or uh, help you with that. Most of the time, what I do in those situations, I just ask um, the Holy Mother God. I say a prayer and I actually see the door of heaven open. And I actually see souls cross into heaven. I also see angels come in and help and surround people uh, to help combat and protect people from negative entities and that negative entities um, and bring healing to that person. Yeah. And again, I love everybody. No ax to grind with anybody. However, uh, I have counseled people, cautioned people, have performed deliverances over people that uh, have these types of uh, gifts and abilities and again you're exactly right these are gifts from god whether people realize it or not and whether they want to acknowledge it or not these this is part of holy discernment and prophetic gifts that god bestows upon us and some people have the dial turned up more than others why is that i don't know we would have to ask god that uh, you know that is something that uh, is in his hands there's a reason for everything so obviously, uh, perhaps it's something that uh, he sort of turned the dial up for some that uh, maybe he chose to be helpers to mankind. Now, here's the danger in it. Now, I know some people with these gifts that are making God first in their life. And they give endless praise and thanks to God and they thank God and praise God for the gifts. They pray to God uh, just as I do, asking God to work uh, through me or through them as they pray to help others. And that's a wonderful thing. But I have cautioned people to get rid of those titles of medium and all that kind of stuff uh, because of what we see in the Bible. Then there are others who don't have any connection with God, don't want any connection with God. Um, some, in fact, see themselves as gods. And some of those very same people are out there giving people daily advice on how to live their lives and, and spirit told them this and told them that and their own life is a shambles. So how in the world would any sensible, rational person out there take advice from someone whose personal life is a shambles? How in the world are they going to lead you anywhere if their own life is a shambles? And so I've seen this so many times, Rick, and, and God has worked through me to help some of these types of people. Uh, it's mind boggling. So people, uh, really have to be careful. And this is where, if you have a real and authentic relationship with God, again, the closer you draw to him, the closer he will draw to you and amplify, and magnify your holy discernment. So you will know what is true and what is not, who is true, who is not, um, and what situations to avoid. So I think this has been a very well calculated and thought out plan over the last 50 years or more in America 
to covertly, most people don't even realize this, lead people away from God. So a variety of things were installed and instilled to do that very thing. And, and so even the invention of the television set, uh, it started out with some very good family-friendly programming back then, but now it has spiraled into a cesspool. 99% uh, of television I wouldn't watch and wouldn't have on in my home. It's garbage. Uh, and not just television, movies, music, um, certainly the internet with all these different uh, platforms that these people are doing the most ridiculous and outrageous things or presenting themselves uh, in a sexual manner or whatever it is. Um, this is all designed, in my opinion, to lead people away from God. So at this point in time, I feel that Yahweh has allowed the devil to have a form of control in the world. So, and I think that time's coming to an end very soon, by the way, sooner than later. And so the devil literally, with this short time that he has, is trying to recreate the world in his image after his likeness, after his kind. So it'll get to the point, and we're already getting there, to where there are people that, if they were listening to this right now, they'd say, this guy, I can't stand him. He's talking God, God, God. I don't want that. You know, and they're automatically offended because they have the spirit of rebellion on them, and they are following right in with the enemy and his plan. I am going to agree with that, but I also have to add this. <clears throat> if you're a believer who's going to say that, then you can't go to those meetings where, you know, a prophet's going to be there. And I hope he gives me a word of prophecy about what I'm supposed to do. But do I believe in the gift of prophecy? Yeah, but if you're going to go to a prophet, it's the same thing as going to a fortune teller. So I do believe in prophecy um, through the church, through, through gifts of prophecy. Um, but I, I do also believe, and, and this, this may be a weird thing, because as a Christian, you're not really, well, not really supposed to, you're not at all supposed to look outside um, for psychics or mediums to talk about your your future mm -hmm. um, or to have them give you a prophecy their prophecy in in where your life is headed mm -hmm. um, but so I mean I've met people with a gift of prophecy that that are psychics or mediums um and i do believe that they have a gift but but not in the church way is i hope that makes sense to somebody because when you're in when you're in church and there's prophecy in church it's more um centered towards the church and not just one person um and i and i say that because you know, you watch TV nowadays and you see mediums and psychics solve crimes and help cases, murder mm -hmm. cases. And and you just, I think there, and I, again, I think there's a good mediums that and psychics that use it for good, but I also believe that psychics and mediums can also use that in a more demonic or evil way. Um, okay, so what I've always just been told in that we're all, we all have some, some psychic ability. Um, it's just if we want to use it or if we want to believe that we have that, you know, like intuition and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I definitely believe that there are, mediums and psychics that will use you know the gift for bad things um but then i think a lot of them are use it for a lot of good 
Um, and it's their gift. I don't think they never, they didn't ask for it. You know, I feel like just these feelings that they have or um, this gift that they have, they didn't ask for it. You know, it's just, it's just up to them or the person to either use it for something good or to help people or to really, you know, just do good with it or do bad stuff with it. Uh, it's a good, real good question because, I mean, I really do believe that we're all, every person is created in the image of God and God has gifted every one of us. And even though that uh, image has been tarnished and, uh, you know, torn down by the, in the fall <clears throat> by sin, you know, I've met uh, people, I mean, uh, that, you know, before they say they were saved, they had, uh, you know, very strong uh, intuitive uh, gifts where they could uh, sense things and know things. I mean, I've had those experiences myself before and even more since I've been saved. But uh, I've seen, especially in a number of cases, especially the women that once they get saved and they get in the church, that uh, they really, they're more prone to have the gift of prophecy mm-hmm. or discernment or other, you know, wisdom, or wisdom, other things that, uh, you know, as they walk uh, in the Lord and walk in the spirit. Uh, so I also think that, uh, you know, as uh, Larry and Heather said that, you know, we can use things for, for good or for evil. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's part of our free will. I believe psychics, uh, believe the power is out there. These abilities and mediums, I've seen them work. Uh, and I've seen a lot that were just kind of, you know, self-proclaimed psychics and they were very vague. And I've seen some that were very specific. Uh, now one specific thing in the Bible, of course, that comes to me, you're familiar with the witch of Endor. That to me is one that talks about, a medium talks about how you're not supposed to be doing that. And it also talks about a ghost. I mean, there's nowhere that a lot of people argue and say, well, when he brought back the ghost of Sam or when she brought back the ghost of Samuel, it was actually a demon posing as it tells us the Bible tells us every time a demon's involved, why would it say it was the ghost of Samuel? If it was a demon, you know, that's, that's my thing with that. But um, I, I think there are some verses that are pretty clear to me about uh about staying away from psychics, uh, staying away from mediums, not seeking answers from the dead. And, and, and not seeking answers from the dead, I don't think that's, I don't interpret it anyway as uh, going into a place that's already haunted, putting down a recorder and saying, is there anybody here to try to get evidence? I think seeking answers from the dead is kind of like you said, what's going to happen to me? What's my future hold? Exactly what uh, King Saul did, what was when he sought out the ghost of Samuel, you know, I think that he was seeking a prophecy. So I think seeking spirits for a prophecy is of course wrong. Now I could argue on both sides of being a medium and say, you know, one, if you have this gift and you're helping others with it, what could be wrong with that? You know, you're doing good and uh, you're helping people find out what's going on in their house and sometimes helping them get rid of it. But on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, of course, demons are very deceitful. They can take something that seems like it's good to get you to buy into that power more when it's really a bad power. So say these powers that are gifts to communicate with spirits or to foretell the future are not gifts from God, but they're gifts from the devil. And the reason that these people are getting these gifts from the devil is so that it causes them to misplace their faith they then no longer need to seek god for the answers they no longer have to pray for the answers they can look to their abilities which are handed to them from satan and it causes them to separate from god and the more they tend to rely on this gift from him the more he can get in there and manipulate them and cause them to have faith in that and lose faith in god and i struggled too for many years in my adult life uh, of regarding psychic abilities, you know, or these gifts or what the other side specifically states as powers. They actually say that word, which is very odd, but I don't know. They do use different kinds of words. I've actually learned words <laughs> from the EVPs that I've gotten. Um, they've even used uh, words from surgeries, uh, different parts of the anatomy that I had no idea. I was like, oh my God, you know, I would reach out to a friend or I'd look it up and I was, you know, I was like, well, that's very interesting. I have thousands upon thousands of EVPs 
thousands. I mean, literally countless. And I still have a lot of them still uploaded hundreds of videos of just, I just put it on there and I upload it. <laughs> you know, some people, I just turn it up really loud so you can hear it. It's amazing. And they do talk, these entities, they do talk about God. Um, so out of thousands upon thousands of EVPs, questions for clients, investigations, sessions about, you know, trying, basically when I say sessions, it's crossing the spirit over. You pray, you hit the recorder, you pray. And then um, if you see anything psychically or mentally or just anything they're showing you, it may not even be psychically, you say it, you see if they say it on the recorder too, it's all confirmed. There's just so much to back everything up. I, I have discussions like this with other people, clergy, all the time who r really get on me about that, about talking about my gifts. Um, uh, I, I always say to them, listen, if you've been given a gift of discernment, and this is a term that we all so, so loosely throw around in our field, you are psychically getting s some type of gift from your creator and you believe in the creator um why be ashamed of it talking about it i have a couple of shows i have a, a live stream show on sundays and a radio show on mondays and i have a lot made a lot of friends over the years witches um mediums psychic mediums i don't like to judge um i always test a person to see what their intent is are they truly using their gifts uh, coming from uh, an angle of love and light, or are they perverting it and doing something uh, more um, darker based with more darker intentions? So I happen to really love mediums. And it's probably because I'm gifted myself and my wife is gifted. Had we not been through some of the things that we've been through and, and have the gifts that, you know, obviously God gave us for a reason, maybe we would think different. And, uh, but I am a big fan of mediums if they're legitimate. If I truly believe they've received a gift from God and they're using it in a positive way, um, I, I believe in them. I really do. There's a reason why we have them, but I get called on that all the time. One of the things I have come to do throughout time, and um, I try to check as many boxes as I can uh, adequately, um, that is natural, that is pretty natural occurrences, things that I try to check off. Um, and one of them is using psychic mediums, clear sentence, clear audience. Anybody that believes they have a gift, I have, you know, I, I don't, mean to use them or test them but i want to see if they're legitimate and i want to test these people because i have my concerns i have my worries i do believe there's a lot of charlatans out there and that's not for me to judge i try not to judge people but in that same stanza they are there are a lot of people that take advantage of people unfortunately and you know i do use psychics mediums and all these people that claim to have abilities and I have been impressed, you know, the, the Catholic Church has um, people they use that talk to God. They talk to God or talk to angels or, you know, they, they seers, they, they touch objects and they can get identification. But that's not technically talking to the dead or the spirit. They're talking to something that's angelic or, um, or touching an object that gives them kind of, uh, kind of a presence of what could be involved with the item or why this item could be a catalyst of what's going on. So the Catholic Church and other Christian churches do use these sort of things. Um, but like I said, talking to the dead, communicating the dead is dangerous. And I do believe everybody has the sixth sense. I, I, I believe that there has been research uh, beyond modern medicine. You know, the ideologies of the pineal gland, the third eye, come from Hinduism, you know, come from um, Japanese folklore, um, Indian folklore, all these things, you know, these things that were much older than our modern civilizations. They thought about these things back then. So I think it's a possibility, but I, know I, do, I do use them and I have seen things that where I brought a psychic medium. They all I knew is, this time meet me at my house. You don't know where you're going. You don't know anything about this case. 
they come and I know everything about the case and I don't give any information. I, I, even if the best cold reader, I try, no, I, try, I try to show no emotion. And I've done this. And I brought these people in that I tend to use over and over again um, and sometimes introduce different people that claim it. But I've been, I've been, I've been swept off the floor a few times. And sometimes, of course, the person I bring sometimes is way off. And, you know, you take that as a miscalculation. We are, we, we all make mistakes, but there's been many times where out of the, t um, eight out of 10 times, they were hundred percent accurate and 90% accurate. They got information that, that they should have not known. Um, uh, people that were lived there before that were deceased, they never had the address, they never had the homeowner. So that stuff's impressive to me. That's interesting. Um, you know, pr impressive thing to me is I'm a good, fr my good friend, Robbie Thomas, he's a crime profiler, he's a psychic medium, but, but the police use him to help find missing people. And he has help in that. So that interests me as well, unless these people are doing such intricate research on why this person could have been missing and are the greatest investigators get investigative minds in the world or they really are tapping to something that we don't see i'm not one to consult mediums never have um done a whole lot of anything in that realm i've had friends who did or who grew up around palm reading and those kinds of things that it's mostly for me been and playful things around um, different times of year, Halloween, etc. Um, as far as mediums go, I don't, as a person of faith, we can't discount that God works in people and gifts us prophecies and um, gifts us in ways that we some may be much more in tune to the spirit as well. Um, not to say that they wouldn't recognize it as such, but maybe if they're gifted in that way and they haven't uh, found Christ in the world or in their lives, that they may read it and use it differently. Um, however, um, at the end of the day, you can walk away from that if that goes against what somebody feels they should be doing. And as Christ instructed, leave the dust off of your sandals. However, they're still a child of God. And for me, I think there is an opportunity to listen to their story and what makes them feel like they have a gift with which they, they share. Now, like anything, there's plenty of people that take advantage of people's um, need to connect people's grief. Um, and so I think those folks are certainly scam artists like there are in, in many professions. But I don't know that it is something, you know, Deuteronomy was the, the time where God was trying to set apart his children and to protect them so they could stay focused on the journey ahead. And all distractions from his guidance would have been um, probably detrimental to the future of that remnant of people. So I could see why there was instruction to stay away from it. Um, I, I don't think that um, that mediums are something that we, like, especially as Christians, that we should be um, interacting with. I am very much against that. Um, you know, I, funny enough, I, I knew this girl in school um, who was Wiccan and she had gotten pretty heavily involved and like whenever I was around her, I just felt like a dark presence and, you know, not that I saw anything or heard anything, but it like, you could just feel like your spirit, you know, who your spirit, you know, we have the Holy spirit in us is filled with light and peace. It was not comfortable around her to the point where, you know, 
one time I had even asked her, you know, do you want me to pray for you? Um, she was having a tough time and, um, you know, she was suffering from like intense migraines and she was just like beside herself. Like, like you would think I said, can I stab you? You know? And she, and that was kind of a moment where I was like, we cannot be friends. We cannot hang out because we are not on the same wavelength. And I don't say that to put myself as being better than her, but you know, I felt like our spirits could not interact. It could not connect. Um, and so I pray for her now from afar, but you know, I've not had any contact with her since. Um, so I, I definitely think that, you know, mediums, people who practice, you know, Wiccan religion, you know, people who call themselves witches or, um, charmers or anything like that. I think that's, you know, anyone who wants to kind of revive the dead, I think that's wrong. Um, you know, I think that, yeah, I, um, you know, I definitely don't think there's, they're speaking with human spirits. They're speaking with demons who are manipulating, you know, their thought process, who are putting those ideas that they're able to communicate with the dead. Um, so I think that as a Christian, we should not be celebrating that um, or even partaking in that. I think that's just not right. I think the Bible makes that pretty clear. And, you know, again, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, your spirit is not going to feel comfortable, you know, being in that environment. So I have friends that are psychics, mediums. Um, there's also prophets though. So, and, and the gift of discernment and seeing things I, the, and I'm sorry, I love my friends that please, please you all, I'm not judging you. If you're listening to this, um, fortune telling. So if it's a fortune teller or these cards, it's kind of like playing lottery, these tarot cards. I don't believe in tarot cards. I don't believe in fortune telling. Um, now I, I believe in walking into a room and cause I've done this myself and somebody's in there and they like, mm, there's that girl's grandmother next to her. She needs to know grandmother has a message. I believe that. Now, if it's somebody saying, this is who you're going to marry. This is when you're going to get married. The initials are J and last initials S all that stuff. Mm, no, I don't believe any of that. I stay away from all that stuff. I do believe in discernment. I do believe in prophecy and foretelling of things. The Bible's all about prophets and prophecy and the book of revelation and all that. But when it comes to the tarot cards, I believe, actually I do believe in gemstones and stuff for energy and quartz and things. I believe that God has put elements on this earth for a reason. I believe in weed marijuana for a lot of stuff. Sorry. I'm, I'm just saying just the natural elements here on earth are here for a reason and God's put, put them here for a reason. And, you know, stones represent things too, like the tribes uh, um, of Judah and stuff. Everybody has a different stone. I'm kind of a crazy person because Catholics follow a certain very strict set of beliefs Yes, I do that. And yes, I do actually teach religion as well for children. Catholic religions was a CCD or religious ed, whatever they call it. But at the same time, I understand the stories in Catholicism. I understand stories in Judaism and Buddhism. I mean, I've studied the world religions. I also do my, do my blessings as Christian. I also do the Wiccan. Well, Wiccans are evil, according to Catholics, because they're just satanic worshipers, which is, oh my gosh. <laughs> is it, oh, very close-minded people. <laughs> they don't understand that Wiccan isn't Satan. Wiccan is nature. It's the earth. And you can't have, look at, look at your Bible stories. You what did God create? He created the planet. He created the trees, the plants, the animals. What is that? It's nature. That's what we were brought up from. That's where he formed Adam and Eve. He took the dirt from the ground and formed the body, the clay into the clay and molded the human. That's where you came from. That's where you end up. You know, where do the bodies go when they die? We put them in the ground. That's earth. So you, I'm not saying don't be Catholic or don't be, you know, Lutheran or any of that. Just open your mind. Get away from me, freak. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. 
Uh, when I first started in this for quite a few years, I was looked at as kind of an outsider as, oh, why would you do that? Uh, you're a freak or uh, you're chasing, chasing ghosts, so to speak. You know, nobody believes you. And then all of a sudden, fast forward about 10 years. Now it's the cool thing to do. Now you're not cool if you're not a paranormal investigator of some sort, or, you know, if you want to, if you don't read tarot cards or use pendulums or, you know, read minds, you're not cool. Because that's, that's the end thing now. Let's go buy an app and we can be ghost hunters. Stop it. Um, <laughs> but now people look back and I'm like, well, where were you when I was just starting out? And you said that I was a freak. And you didn't want anything to do with me. Now that is popular and I'm getting popular because of it. Now, now you want to be friends and, you know, you want to, you want to chum around and, little too little too late the spirit is control of my hands and i i paint according to that guidance into what i'm seeing but also i'm being led and directed through what i'm doing and that reward is so much greater because you know jesus if i get to hear from jesus directly i get to see people healed i get to experience um, healing in my own life i get to uh, see the deliverance of God and God acting more powerfully in my life. And that's far more rewarding and worth any naysayers, any negativity, anything that comes from me from people that just kind of fades away in the background because God is so much greater. And what he does for me is so much greater in his presence and in miraculous presence and help is always there for me in the practical sense and in my life and in the spiritual sense as so I'm have to say to that is to, to just adhere and just cling to God and just not look back. I mean, regardless of what people say to you, regardless of how people treat you, always just keep your eyes focused on him. And his reward is greater for you than anybody's criticism of you. Sure. And it's sad, you know, and it's rare, but it does happen. It has happened. Uh, and it's very, very sad because, uh, I love people and my mission in life by the power of God to help is to help as many people as I possibly can. And whether that is, uh, you know, clients that come to me or friends or family members or whatever it may be. Uh, I certainly always want to be there and try and help anybody in any way possible that I can. But yes, there are uh, people that and again it's very small number and very rare but uh some were family members that just they don't want it they don't want god they don't want to hear about god and uh, so therefore they would uh rather either avoid or just all together not be around because they don't want to hear that and then you know on my end i would have to make changes to it say well, I got to be careful not to say this or say that. And that's not my nature because I'm, you know, I am who God has made me to be and I can't be anybody else. I'm not a fake. I can't be that way, but I do try to be considerate of others. Well, just um, with the paranormal stuff, not much, but when a lot of people at my old church knew I wanted to make horror movies that they, I feel they pretty much disowned me for that. And I'm pretty sure if I would have mentioned an interest in the paranormal and not just in the Christian term, which, you know, possession, I'm more than sure they would have disowned me even more for that. I don't think that, that I've been shunned that I know of. Uh, I, I do notice when I, I really don't go on Facebook that much. But when I do post stuff about the unknown on my on my personal, I think it's become a little bit more uh, acceptable for people to talk about their beliefs. But personally, no, no, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah, I really have. I mean, as far as like my friends, they're all very supportive. They think it's super cool. Um. Some of my family members, you know, they think it's neat, but I have two very close family members who, like, don't like it at all. And it's really hard because 
they're like my closest family member and it's really hard to like just express the things that I like to do or that I believe in that are real and they don't accept it and it's just like it's really hard for me for that and you know they're always trying to like just guide me in the right way and and I listen to them 100%, you know, and with an open heart. And I listen to everything they have to say. I'm not going to ever say anything bad about it or disagree with them because I 100% agree with the things that they tell me. But it's really hard when they're um, – they just don't understand. Mm -hmm. So it is – I do have that. And it's, it's hard because I want to share and I want to be excited about it. And to not be able to tell like the closest person to me about it, it does. It's pretty hard. Um, yeah. For that, but I just like wish they understood that, like the paranormal and stuff. You have to have a strong faith to do it because if you go into a location or a haunted place or that is possibly with evil and demons and if you're not in a strong faith or if you don't feel like you have god behind you then you could totally be taken over to the dark side <laughs> that can come into you or whatever it may be or get an um, attachment huh or get an attachment yeah or, or anything and i feel <laughs> like i wish they understood that you know that i do have a strong faith and i do believe but i think it's just something that they're not familiar with and they you know and they read in the bible that it's not good and it's it's all the devil it's all demons no spirits are good and things like that so it, it's hard so i have i'm not saying they shun me or anything but to have you know like these really two close family members just not agree with it and we get along i'm not saying we don't get along but we get along but sometimes i feel like there could there's a little tension mm -hmm. I guess you could say sometimes even just when we talk and, and everything. So, I mean, that, that does happen. And it's not like, and I don't tell them things because of that reason. Sure. Um, sometimes I won't post something on like say my personal social media because you know, they look at it and I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. So I do have, I do think about them a lot. Um, but I just, want them to know that I do have a strong faith and if I didn't who knows I could have already been taken over or something could have followed me home but it, it's hard so I'm not saying I got shunned but I am I do deal with um that yeah, well listen as a as a pastor I mean you can ask uh Eric because he's known me for you know for a long time uh I'm you know, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of the same things. I've always had an interest in, uh, you know, the, the supernatural and uh, the, you know, or the paranormal. I think that, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of things going through my head right now about this uh, because I see this, you know, from uh, several points of view. But listen, I've never been afraid to say what I think, what I believe, and it uh, it's got me in trouble. I've been kicked out of churches as a pastor, kicked out of denominations because I, I'm not afraid to speak my mind and what I believe. And, uh, you know, and that's got me in trouble. My wife says uh, it's because I'm a rebel. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, but the, you know, the truth of the matter is, I think that, uh, you know, I've, you know, like Eric, I've always had an interest in, uh, you know, horror movies and uh, I still do. Listen, I, I like to read, uh, yeah, and he's a, listen, I, I read, of course, I read, you know, study the Bible. I read a lot of good Christian uh, books. I also like novels, uh, you know, all different types. Uh, uh, I like, you know, I have a thing about, uh, you know, you were talking before the uh, podcast about uh, you know, serial killers. I've actually done quite a study on serial killers. I read a book uh, about one of the first uh, documented serial killers called The Murder of, uh, of Little Shepherds uh, that actually took uh, place in France at the uh, turn of uh, not this century, but the last century. Uh, so, I mean, I have some strange interest that people say I shouldn't have as a pastor, but uh, you know, I thank God for the experiences I've had in life. I've dealt with the supernatural, I did with the demonic. I, you know, and I thank God for the scriptures. I mean, uh, you know, uh, in Ephesians chapter six, you know, uh, Paul says that our battle is not against, uh, you know, we battle not only against flesh and blood, 
against powers and principalities and you know rulers in high places. I mean, he's talking about the paranormal. He's talking about the supernatural. But you were saying something before uh, about you know words and terminology. You know, there is accepted things in the church and unaccepted things and words and phrases as well. You can talk about the supernatural, but don't talk about the paranormal. Uh, you can talk about spirits, don't talk about ghosts. Uh, you know, I think that there's you know some of these things uh, that you know. And as a pastor, I'm definitely probably more aware of the, the rules uh, of the acceptable and unacceptable uh, than a lot of people because I've had so many conversations and I've had people, you know, try to correct me on uh, my terminology uh, mm -hmm. at times as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the truth of the matter is, uh, you know, there is supernatural, there is a paranormal, there is, you know, these things are real. And I think that yeah, and for me, I have a very inquisitive mind, and I want to know things. I, you know, I mean, for me, I uh, have a master's degree in counseling psychology. So for me, you know, studying serial killers is very interesting because you see uh, the human mind, the human heart, at, at its worst state. Uh, and I think to me, that's that it's it's interesting. Now, you know, some might say as a pastor, I shouldn't have that interest, that it's wrong, but. Uh, we can't help who God made us to be. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I look at, uh, you know, Heather with, you know, some of the, you know, things that she deals with in the church and she is, it, she's in a profession that's, that's tough uh, within Christian circles mm -hmm. because people don't know what to make of it. I think fear, mm -hmm. you have so many people who are driven by fear and, uh, you know, as Christians, we're not to be afraid, you know, perfect love cast out fear. So I think that, uh, you know, I have been judged by different things that I believe, different things I say, and that hasn't stopped me. So I guess uh, that, that's good as well. Yeah, you know, God is good. Um, well, I, I have an uh, an uncle who's a deacon at a, at a Baptist church, and uh, he hasn't shunned it. But you know, I, I asked him about it, and he said, "Well, I don't. You know, I don't think there's." These, these ghosts out there. He said, I think it's usually the devil messing with people. And that was it. There was no like shunning or anything like that. Um, however, friends that are, are, are Catholic uh, tend to do a little more shunning, um, you know, and this is particularly when it comes to going into these places that seem to have more of a demonic, possible demonic presence there. Um, they say that this stuff needs to be left to a priest. Uh, that only a priest can go in there and do that, and, and basically you can't. Now, I will say, uh, I, I guess to piggyback on that a little bit, um, a couple of things. Uh, of course, going by the Bible, I believe that uh, Jesus gives us, as his followers, the power to cast out demons. Now, I, I'm, of course, not going around doing exorcisms, but... I found with doing with starting out with the residential investigations, a lot of times it was hard to get somebody to come in. Like we could go in there and kind of diagnose to an extent and say, this is possibly what's going on. And, and this is probably how you need to get rid of it. But keeping those resources that could go in there and, and, and do that house cleansing for them was tough. And a lot of times they could never get somebody that's a clergyman or, or somebody that's a priest. They couldn't get them to come out. They couldn't get them to come out to their house. Is that I reach out to my church? Do I reach out to the Catholic church? I can't get anybody to come out here. So I started early on studying up on uh, a couple different methods that were put together. And uh, this book that this Protestant minister wrote, I can't remember his name for the life of me because it was years ago, but uh, we came up with this, basically a Protestant Christian method of cleansing the house and uh, science. I, I don't like to say scientifically, but statistically speaking, this house blessing has worked eight out of 10 times since we've been doing it. Uh, it's, it's had a very high success rate. I mean, there was one lady, her house, 17 years, she lived in this place, all kinds of activity. We did this house blessing for, and it worked uh, according to her, of course. So 
it's 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 interesting i guess when some people say that hey you got to be this kind of a person you got to be a, an ordained minister you got to be a priest to go in there and help these people uh, i don't think you do i think you just have to be someone of god uh, and using his intent and his will to go in there and push whatever's in that house out uh, we've even been called in and I'm, you know i'm not saying anything negative about uh, anyone else of course but there have been quite a few cases where someone has called us up and said, I've had a priest come into my house and uh, I still have the activity going on. One guy said the priest came down in the basement. Uh, he stepped one foot and this was a, a pretty serious house. It's some serious stuff going on. He said the priest set one foot in the basement, sprinkled some holy water, wouldn't go any further. He came up and he said, you guys need to leave. You need to get out of this house. And that was the advice from the priest, you know, so. I, I guess just sometimes a different approach maybe helps all the time, man. You know, I, uh, I'm 30 years old. I've done this for 15 years, like legitimately. Like I know people like to like to throw dark uh, I, dates at like a dog board and say that's the date they've been involved. But I have a lineage of people that can say, yeah, James has been around this long. I learned from Carl Johnson 47 years. You know, I have these people that of, I've been on their tutelage of that will say that yeah, this man's been around. I've been around for 15 years, half my life. Um, so you can remember how young I am. I still get, oh, he's too young, but I have doubled experience of somebody my age half the time, um, within this, within this field, within this, uh, pseudo science. So I get it all the time. And even of course, on the realm of when, um, at conventions doing lectures, um, or at a case and, you know, maybe a family member is there and they question me, why are you doing this? Um, but a lot of my time, especially at conventions when like, a very strict Catholic comes up to me and say, oh, you're talking about demonology. You're here at a paranormal conference. But then I look at him, aren't you Catholic? Then what are you doing here? You know, what are you doing here? So I, uh, I'm not, I'm not a stupid person. You know, there's stupid mistakes that I make. I'm a person, you know, um, I'm not the smartest. I'm not perfect. I don't know everything. But the one thing that I know is I know what my intent is. So you know, I have been judged and I have been whipped. I have been lashed so many times. You know, sometimes I've, I've been to the moment that I give up. And then I realize, I take, a, I take a step back and I realize these people don't walk in my shoes. They don't know who I am. They don't live my life. And at the end of the day, they have their opinion. They can say whatever they want of me. But if they judge me off the book by the cover and don't read the internals of who I am and get to know me. And that's their problem. So yeah, I've come across it. It's always been about the age thing more so. But if people question my background, of course, you know, they question the United States Old Catholic Church saying that, you know, I basically am a dress up cler cleric, um, things like that, which is a pith, uh, you know, they don't go to the seminary courses that I go through. They don't go to these things. They don't, they don't sit at a computer and, for hours on end and read the most ridiculous things like a squirrel. You know, I could be reading about quantum physics and I read something about anthropology. You know, they're not in front of these things and learning. They don't understand my background. They take my age. They take my faith. They take the things that people hear about me. And that's, and that's just the general consensus of what people think of me sometimes. But yeah, I dealt with it. But yeah, you know what Kelly Clarkson said, if whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of thing. And, you know, I hate to quote Kelly Clarkson because, you know, as much as she's a great singer, it's not my kind of taste in music, but that's true though. You know, you know, you can let people break you down, but they don't live in your life. You know, they don't pay my bills. They don't, they don't, they don't do anything with my name. You know, they can trounce my name in the mud, but it is what it is. People want to take it as it is. That's great. I don't talk about it. This is the most I have ever talked about my belief in anything in the paranormal or spiritual realm. realm. Um, I just, I might have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are like-minded, but I have never said one way or another or, or gotten into deep conversations with even family uh, so I can't say that I would be shunned. Maybe some would think I'm a little bit of a nut job and, and, but my family's too polite to tell me that they would just wouldn't say anything. And, uh, so 
No, I've never encountered anything like that. The, the thing I have encountered in a handful of those conversations is like I mentioned earlier, that there are uh, other family members who've had their own encounters or um, things they've heard or seen that they made them believe that there's something there that we just aren't aware of until we have crossed over as well. And um, so there again, it's, they're kind of like-minded. So I've never had to deal with being shunned until this video goes live. And then I'm going to be <laughs> ripped apart on social media. <laughs> Not really. I mean, it, it, I, it, yeah, it, it isn't something that you would normally talk about. I mean, it's not something that comes up in you know daily normal conversation, but I don't know if I've if I've lost anyone because of my thoughts of the paranormal or, or my belief in the paranormal. Um, if I have, I don't care because I really don't really hate when I have those kind of people around me that I just so pejorative say this doesn't exist. You're an idiot. I mean, I'm an idiot, but just not for this. So we've had the people that you know, we've explained to them, you know, let's say we were out, one of us or two of us went out to the store to pick up batteries or something. Cause you know, they're always dying when we're on investigations. Um, so we're at the store, we have our shirts on from the team and someone will come up to you and be like, Oh, what's that on your shirt? You explain it to them and they're like, Oh, get, you know, get the hell away from me. You know, you're going to have that. You're also going to have the people that if they find out anything dealing with you in the paranormal, you're like the coolest person for the next five minutes while they tell you their entire life story about every ghost they've interacted with and how they're so badass that they could go after them and chase them out of their house themselves. And yeah, so you have a little bit of everything. Um, the main thing to realize with it is, is depending on what their religious background is, is going to tell you how far acceptance is going to go with them. So you have Catholics and I mean, I, it's, it's not a stereotype by any means because you're going to have variables and everything. And I mean, nothing in the world is straightforward down the road, you know, it, there's a fork in the road, I'm going to end up running face first into the pole in the middle. So, um, but for the most part, your Catholics are going to be very close minded. If it's not in the scripture, if it's not what they've been taught, then it's not real. Or if it is real and it's put in front of you, they're in front of them, it's going to be evil. And that takes us all the way back to that first question we were talking about. You know, other religions. Chinese, look at Taoism. They accept the fact that they know spirits are out there, but they still at the same time perform this huge, hugely elaborate exorcism ritual that it's literally, they perform them at festivals. And it's this huge elaborate thing with chanting and with motions and big gestures and all this stuff. It's a show. Think of it like Vegas almost. They do this big performance to exercise these demon out of the person. And then they literally, the, the Taoist, um, I, don't, I don't even know what they're called, but think of them like shamans, like the medicine man type priests or whatever, whatever term you want to use. They literally cut themselves open and bleed on the person. And then they take the blood and wipe it onto the door frames of the houses to keep the spirits that they just expelled out of the body from going into other houses. It's like Passover all over again. Um, but I mean, it's just, it, no, nobody, nobody is going to accept everything. Um, it's, it's not humanly possible that you are going to come across things paranormal that will question anything you have religiously in your life. No matter what religion you are, you are going to come across something that you're going to go, well, 
No, that no, that's not possible. At the same time, you can be an atheist and say there is no God, and you are still going to come across things that you are just going to be like, what the was that? And that doesn't make sense. I said there's no God. Why am I seeing heavenly things with glowing wings and stuff all around me? This doesn't make sense. You're going to have it. it. It all goes back to that little narrow mind. Everybody thinks that they're right. And as long as you keep it between them lanes, life is good. But as soon as you try to take any of them off ramps, it's all going crazy. Because I've always been a little off. I was raised by older parents. My sister is 17 years older than me. So it's like I didn't have a sister, but I did. I was raised in a mobile home park for retired people. I was around a lot of dead people. <laughs> um, I guess I have always been used to being shunned. If they don't like me, they don't like me, and I'm tired of trying to make people like me. Um, I have respect for people who will ask me questions. They don't have to agree with me at any point. You know, it's like I went and got my nails done yesterday. This lady was sitting next to me. Actually, it was very interesting because I walked in there like, here, you have to wear a mask. Well, I have asthma and I can't have everything covered or down I go. And they didn't want to listen to me at first. And this really nice lady goes, look, she can't breathe. And they're like, oh. I'm like, thank you. That was, I'd never seen her before very nice lady. I'm like, thank you. I really appreciate that. So she kept checking on me. We're sitting side by side and she saw that I had this tattoo and she goes, so what does that mean? Well, I had one woman run out of a class one time because she didn't even bother asking questions. Well, when I had this done, there we go. Yeah. Okay. We went back and forth on which way is the correct way to do it. You put your arm, it's one way you put your arm, it's one way. Well, at the top is my faith. And it has basically to do with, you know, earth, air, wind, your faith, God. And I said, you know, we tried to figure out how could we make it clear that it's not the wrong thing. Well, I can't have them writing all over the place, you know. But I'm thinking of going back in and on top having God put there. So at least that, that's the only important one to me. Right. You know, so we got to talking. She goes, I didn't know that. I said, you know, when people think about witches, they think about brooms and this and that. I said, any, but you know, it's people who believe in nature. They love nature. They love trees. They love to be out in it. I guess she could call a hunter, a, you know, a witch. And she started laughing at that thought, you know, so we got to talking and we talked about ghost adventures and so on and so forth. But she asked the questions, mm -hmm. you know, she's like, why this? And you know, this happened to me when I was little and, you know, started coming out. Well, I got a request from her on Instagram, mm. you know, a friend or whatever we are on Instagram. We follow each other like a bunch of puppies. And she even asked, she goes, you know, do you get a lot of being hated on? I'm like, are you kidding? I said, on one of the postings of my episode, one person says, I look like I'm married to Satan. And I, look, I said, Tony, you know, my husband really wouldn't like being called that. And I said, and we are faith-based. I said, I believe in God. And I said, you know, before you make statements like that, you may want to ask a person a question. I said, otherwise, you don't sound very smart. You can have your thing. I'll have my thing. You know, yeah, I've been hated on. We get hated on because they don't like the fact that we didn't have enough emotions in one of our episodes of, you know, and what? You want us to be real, but you want us to be fake? Make up your minds. <laughs>there's just so much out there and there's so many things that we don't know about and it's so exciting 
you know, even if you sit as an investigator and you sit in these, you know, dark, damp, cold places for hours on end, you know, talking to yourself, when you get that real good evidence, just that one little phrase or, or something that really gets you, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. This is why we keep coming back. You know, that's why investigations take, you know, six to 20 hours to do or more for maybe two minutes of evidence, if you're lucky. Yeah. And again, look, I love all people and, and I know probably thousands of people all over the world, you know, and, and uh, I have a lot of friends that are involved in, in the paranormal and, and whether that is, uh, you know, in the investigations, TV shows, whatever, whatever it may be. I don't even watch those shows myself. I don't even watch my own shows that I'm on. Um, I always caution people that uh, this is not a game. And I always give this analogy. You know, if you pulled up to a beach and the sign was there that said shark infested waters, do not swim here. And if you get out of your vehicle and you jump in that water anyway, you saw the sign that said shark infested waters and you still get in there. Well, chances are there's going to be a, a price to pay for that. Uh, it's the same thing. And I, so I caution people, um, be careful in seeking these things out because there are consequences. So in my life, and let me say this, I am not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. I'm just, I try to be real. I, I try to do the best that I can do. And I try to be the best that I can be in each and every day of my life. Um, but I'm a human being just like everybody else. And we all make mistakes in life. There's not a person that walks the face of the earth that doesn't make some kind of mistake in some way. Um, but what I try to share with people is that for me, I'm always seeking God. Um, there's no thrill for me. And look, these TV shows, they call me up and I do them. Uh, I go there and the blessing in it is that if somebody's watching and they see me on there, I've had some people that were ready to commit suicide and they have to see me on a TV show and reached out and God worked through me to save them and, and to help them to move forward and have a quality of life. There's a great blessing in that. Uh, so God can use anything to his favor and to work through someone to help someone. But as far as, and I've cautioned people on this, uh, being almost like addicted to watching those types of shows and to, you know, going into investigations, uh, you would have to step back and say to yourself, why? What am I getting out of this? What purpose does this serve? Am I glorifying God in this? I just hope, um, you know, people just be more open-minded and to not close their minds so much when they get, um, like maybe signs from their loved ones, because I get signs from my loved ones all the time, but I feel like it's just how you interpret it. It could be a bird or it could be a song on the radio um, so I just hope like people really just know that their loved ones are still around them and to take just these little signs that they think are kind of odd or weird. Oh, that was, you know, grandma's favorite song. Just, you know, that they're, they're with us. They're past, but I know that they're still here with us in, in spirit. I think a lot of people associate the paranormal with the occult because there's so many occult practices that are done in the paranormal field. And it's all about you, your organization and how you conduct these investigations. Because if these, if these spirits are in the house, in someone's house, and you're going out there uh, to find out why they're there, find out how to get them out of there, if that's what the people are, are asking for, you know, if it's a darker entity or something like that. Um, we're not going out summoning spirits. We're not using Ouija boards or any light and candles or you know, we don't even have like a set of medium with us at this point. We don't have anybody that's summoning. We're going out there and we're just using normal means. We're setting down a recorder saying, hey, I'm Jeff. Is there anybody else here with us? 
if there's not anybody else there, we won't get an answer. If there is, we will. You know, it's not like we're summoning or anything like that. Uh, so I think you can very well investigate claims of the unknown, claims of paranormal activity. And, and as long as you're not practicing anything that's considered a cult, anything that's going to summon a demon, I think you can be both. Absolutely. And I, and I think in some cases they kind of go hand in hand because you got these people who, like I said, are Christian. Some of them are on the fence Christian. They were raised Christian. They kind of backslid a little bit. They have this stuff going on in their life and they need help. If they call out somebody, if there's nobody in this field that has Christian faith, who's going to help them? Because sometimes it comes down to just a matter of faith and strengthening that faith and using the power of that faith to push whatever's in your home out. That's another thing. I was, a, I've always been a very private person. I only recently went public and it was because some of my clients wanted to go public and I had a lot of teams reaching out who would hear about me through word of mouth saying, can you help me? And so that's kind of how it just, and they were like, please teach us, please help us. How do you do this? I've never gotten an EVP. I've been doing this for a year, this and that. And I'm like, well, first of all, all the, it's very simple. I pray. That is the number one thing that I do. And I pray for forgiveness if it is wrong. And I pray for permission to be granted this kind of access to this, this world we live in, because we know God has done these different things. He's wiped out the world. He's rebuilt it. He's redone it. He can change things at any time. And if they're saying it's from him, I have to keep that into consideration just in case, because it's, it's a very stressful dynamic to be in because you're like, okay, well, I don't want to go against you if you do want me to do this and I don't want to embrace it. And one of the things I've learned is when you have the light as they call it, and these angels and other entities that stand, say they stand with heaven, they say um, that basically it's like we're a bigger target for diabolical entities to sum it up. And when they, when we do encounter these entities and I learned this firsthand and I never forgot it because of what happened to me and my family. Um, they never forget you. They, they know where you are. They know how to find you. You have to protect yourself and you do need to pray. And um, so I'm like, okay, well, another thing, when these diabolical entities are present, it is more difficult for these other entities, whether they be ghosts, um, you know, like anthropomorphic souls or a, um, like an ethereal entity or something else, which there are other things I've learned. Um, it's like they block it in some way if they're too close to you. And another thing I learned too, is that these diabolical entities can't touch you when you pray and there's angelic entities in the room because when i've left the recorders running they say the demons are running or there will be ghosts on the psv7 um and the um any kind of voice recorder they'll say christ is here christ is coming christ has taught you much um we need to go into the light. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for God. We need the Lord. We need the Lord. They always say the Lord. That's the most common. I've heard God, but I've heard the Lord more than anything. Um, I have heard them say Jesus, but they say Christ more than they say Jesus. That's another thing I've noticed on the EVPs over all these years. We're talking about faith and the paranormal, but in the reality, our faith is paranormal. Oh my gosh, you and I must be a little psychically connected here. They do exist. They coexist, whether you want to, people want to acknowledge it or believe it or not. They do exist. They can exist. And it's okay. Exactly. And, um, I, you know, he hasn't admitted it to me, but there's a bishop here in town that I go to all the time. I teach an online course, Introduction to Spiritual Warfare. And many times I have him read over my course to put his blessing on it, tell me if I should change this or that's too much or, you know, maybe add this. And uh, he will ask me all the time, what, what type of case are you working on now? He wants to know the cases I'm working, what I've experienced. And I think that's how he, um, that's how he gets 
to experience that too without having to um you know announce it to the world that uh he <laughs> He's into the paranormal and he's into the ghost shows and the ghost stories. I think, you know, most priests, well, like I said, there's some that will call me on a case and they'll be waiting for me outside when I get there and say, I've been in there and I just can't go back in. I'm sorry. And, and I, I mean, from, from the very moment I get there, I have to set ground rules. So I usually, and the clients uh, sometimes are really taken back by this, but I don't enter the home normally. I drop to my knees at the front door and I say a series of very special prayers. And then I crawl on my hands and knees into the home because I need my, my weapon, my big weapon is humility. And then I can't think of anything more humble than to do that. And then I usually sit the whole family down on a couch in the living room, have them all remove their shoes and socks. And I have a little basin with me full of holy water and I will wash all their feet in holy water because that's another extremely humble thing I can think of doing. And sometimes while I'm doing that, you can just hear everything in there that doesn't belong, screaming and scurrying and leaving the home. And all of a sudden, you, it could be in the middle of the night. It feels like a big, gigantic blanket has just been lifted off over the home. And everybody takes, does a big collective, it's like all of a sudden everybody can just breathe and see and hear and everything. Everybody feels great. And you just know that um, it's, it's going to be okay, but it's not over. These people now have to be taught how to, you know, dot all their I's, cross their T's, close all the portals, keep them closed. Because if you slip up and you reopen one of these portals, um, they come back a, a lot stronger and usually with friends and they're way more pissed off if that can be possible because the hatred that they have for us, uh, I could never adequately put in, put into words for you. It's like um, take Hannibal Lecter if he really existed and times him by a million and give that person the powers of an angel the powers and the knowledge of an angel. And that's what you're talking about with demons. Um, they're older than time itself. They're powerful. They're knowing. And yes, I give them, I give them a healthy respect because they could kill me. Um, but I, and I don't hate them, you know, because uh, when you start allowing the things that they feed on to get in your heart, then you can't battle them. So I don't hate them. Um, but I don't, I don't talk to them either. A lot of the uh, exorcists want to get their name, want to talk to them. My training, we're not encouraged to have any dialogue with dialogue with the, uh, um, the uh, malevolent entities at all. So, so I guess, I don't know if I answered your question or not. You were right on the money. It, they can exist. They do exist. They coexist. And if everybody who fought that, uh, was more accepting of that role, I think uh, the paranormal field, or at least the field of deliverance ministry would probably um, be a lot stronger for it. Well, I think faith in the paranormal is important. You know, um, I think once we open up and start understanding that there's so much knowledge out there, people will, will understand the compartments of our brain. You know, one of them is being faith. Why is it there? If it's not meant to be there, why is it there, right? If we're not meant to have faith, why is it a, a, a key component of our brain? So faith is very important. It doesn't have to be faith in the higher power like I have it or many other people in this world have. You know, there are a lot of religious people and of many different faiths out there. Um, but why is it out there? So it's important. If you have faith in something, it's, it's, per, it's, it's important. Um, to have faith, especially when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, especially when you're dealing with the paranormal, because if you're going into these places, what's your, what's your means of protection? What's your fallback? When something starts hitting at you, what, what, what's your strength? What's your point? What do you go to? You know, so it could be faith in something, but faith is very powerful. Um, faith's a part of our lives, a part of who we are. It's part of our brain. Once again, I'll repeat like I am being a dead horse, but it's important. And so faith, regardless, uh, is a key component of paranormal. I do believe they go hand in hand because 
I truly believe if you don't believe in God, how can you believe in ghosts? Regardless of your position on paranormal and faith, just remember that all things need to be done in love with gentleness and kindness and compassion. And until you walk in those shoes, and I know people are making decisions based on scripture as guidance, and that's great for each of you and each of us individually. But again, at the end of the day, it's how we treat each other. And I just think that needs to be part of people's consideration, whether they're genuinely listening to try to learn and understand, or they're only hearing what they want to hear and they begin to judge. For all of us to just pause long enough to remember that until we walk in each other's shoes, we have to simply love. I think that for, for too long, um, people have been ostracized for believing in or seeing or experiencing anything paranormal. I mean, it, it happens all around us. It's just, I think, people's own insecurities is what drives people to you know, ignore it exists. It's like, God, is this from you? Like, I think a lot of people don't really ask God about things. And they, and they shut him off. And they don't even keep their ears open to hear, you know. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people push things off and, and they don't, they're not really open. Out of all people, you should be more open up to God and, and, and things in, in prayer and try to find answers. And, and I don't think people put the effort into that anymore. I personally believe that they are in their own way, one and the same. They are just different branches. You know, if you look up the term, look, it just means outside of, you know, it just, you know, not normal. You know, I believe in Bigfoot too. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. It's just a, a different branch of it. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different People that have come forward and said, this is what happened to me. People that have witnessed different things, you name it. You got to keep an open mind. And just because you believe in it doesn't mean you're a Satan worshiper or you don't believe in God or whatever. I couldn't do it without him. I could not, could not. And I say to my husband all the time, I still do not get why I do this. He can do it without me. He doesn't need me. He can do anything and everything. Why? I keep hearing because human beings are strange. They need something to hold on to. They need something to touch. You guys are what I have sent out there for them to touch. You know, it's, that's the best thing I can come up with. It's just you got to keep an open mind because there's too much in this world and of this world to, to say no to. You're going to be losing out on a lot of stuff and a lot of lessons and a lot of neat things and a lot of neat people in the end. I have met some amazing people, you know, and I could probably call most of them and they'd be there for me. And they all have these big hearts and they're kind and they all have their own forms of belief. Thank <laughs> you.